everyone. I would like to introduce Mike Bidolf, the writer and author of uh, many books, <laughs> as well as many articles. He uh, is a professor, um, he used to teach at the Cardiff University. I don't know, Mike, if you still teach there. No, I don't know. No. Not at the moment. Okay, so I was the graduate of the course that Mike was running, and um, it was a great pleasure to take place in that course as well and to be selected. <laughs> and now Mike is working at the municipalities, so he will give us more of the overview of that smart cities. Maybe they are not that smart, as Mike is stating, and maybe we can have a little bit more his opinion on the smartness or not smartness. Okay, over to you. <laughs> over to me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Sky. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen. Uh, let's see if this works because it is really important. Uh, doesn't create an option for me to do this. Right. I'll take your time. It's not giving me the option. Oh, hold on a minute. I just got to work out which one it is. I've just got to choose the right screen. There we are. It's more complicated than okay. I thought it would be. So hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I am uh, Mike Bidolf, and it's really nice to be with you. Um, if you could pop into the chat where you're sitting today, I'd find that really interesting just to find out uh, just how smart we're being by sitting in a, I'm sitting in my front room. So it's quite interesting just to think about where you might be sitting and the sorts of things that you might see outside of your window. Um, and uh, Sky asked me to to talk about smart cities, and I said to her, "It's um, it's not necessarily something that I'm a profound expert upon, but I thought it would be interesting to reflect a little bit on." Well, she she encouraged me to talk about my job, my work, and whether and how it could be made smarter or not, uh, which I think is a very pertinent and relevant thing. Um, so I came up with a slightly uh, humorous um, title, "Not So Smart." Uh, but but I, what I want to do is, is look at how, whether and how we can locate smart thinking, which I think is what you're trying to do, uh, within the context of urban design thinking and practice, which is essentially my job. I'm a, a planner and an urban designer. And as Sky said, I work for a, a, a council, a municipal government. Um, and so, you know, we should be trying to do these sorts of things or you as academic uh, students should be trying to think about how people like me doing my job could be smarter. Uh, just to give you very briefly a, a sense of where I'm sitting, I work in a, a small nation called Wales, which is to the left of England, um, possibly a, a lot less well known than England, uh, unless you're in England and then you'll know about it. Uh, and I sit uh, and work in Cardiff, which is the capital city of Wales, which is in the bottom right hand corner of this map of Wales, which you can see it looks a little bit like a pig's head, I suppose. Um, I, Wales I is. I'm sorry, Mike, we can't see the next slide. Can you shift? Ah, that's interesting. I wonder how I do that then. That's very good, is it? Hmm. That's frustrating because I can't work out now how to change the slides. Does that change it? Uh, not yet. But we can see the slides, so we can see the screen. You can see me, but... Um, and the slides as well. Yeah, that's working. That's working. Does that work? Yeah. Did you, do you actually just see... Sorry, everybody, this is just the technology. Um, can you see the PowerPoint um, slide or can you see uh, the, the PowerPoint? Screen, the whole PowerPoint screen. Including everything else, okay. I wonder what I do about that then. <laughs> I don't want you um, just to see that. If you press F5... Okay. Give us the full screen. Mm. Nope. That, no, nope. Doesn't still work. not doing it. It doesn't. It's not doing what it's supposed to do, basically. Um, Anyways, we we are fine with this one as well. Kinda. Let's just make it as big as we can. It's not great, is it? Okay. Hopefully that made it a bit bigger. Anyway, so I, I can point at this now. <laughs> so I, I live and work here uh, in Cardiff, which is the capital city of a region. Uh, and if I go to the next picture, it just gives you some some pictures of of the city. I was trying to think, how could it, I give you a sense of, of the sorts of place where I work? And of course, we, we all work in very different places. And I suppose what what we should be trying to work out is, is, is whether and how we can be smart in all of the different places that we might be confronted by. Uh, when we are either doing research uh, or we are um, doing our jobs. 
Um, so hopefully you'll be able to, my text is big enough on my screen. So this is just what I want to do. I want to really reflect on, and as I have done, is there a smart city? Because I often come across people talking about this, um, either in an academic context or in a professional context. Um, it's, it's almost like the next big thing. Um, and for me, as somebody who plans a city or is involved in the planning of a city, it's, it's obviously an important question to answer. Um, uh, can we plan in a smart way? And um, my conclusion is that there are lots of good things that come from these tendencies, and it's really important to emphasize this. Um, we have the opportunity today of getting access to what some people call big data. It's not an area I work in. I'm not a data scientist or, you know, I'm, I'm very much a, a planner, um, but I can completely understand that there are great insights that can be got from uh, using and understanding data really carefully. And I think the COVID crisis is a really good example of that, where health data within a political con polit particular context where it could be collected carefully um, provided really useful insights into how to combat um, what for us was a global crisis really in many respects. Um, so that's really good and that's a, a, obviously a relatively new thing. Um, the other thing is smart technologies, um, which we've probably all started to come across in, 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 in daily life as they should really through, through consumer products, um, but also through particular pieces of technology which we can use in a professional setting. Um, these technologies allow us to control and guide small areas of our life, which is something I want to try and explain um, a little bit more detail um, in terms of my own area of work and, and in, in relation to our city. Um, but, and I think it's quite a big but, at least for me at the moment, some of the, some of the problems that planners and designers uh, like me, the problems we're trying to solve and to understand um, don't already all, always readily suit uh, these technologies to be used to, to kind of understand and solve them. We have to think in a slightly different way. So, and this is what I want to try and emphasize, that there's kind of a, a limit, I suppose, to how smart we can be. Um, and that's, uh, that's a choice, which to a certain extent we can, we can take. Find my... Um, the other thing is I, I am a planner and I, I wasn't sure how many of you might be planners as well, uh, but it, it struck me that we, we may be working in quite different planning systems. Um, and there are, if I can try and make that fit on the screen a little bit better, oh, it's not going to work. Yet. Anyway, there are regulatory, what, what I would call regulatory planning systems, which are common to uh, what, what I would call continental Europe, particularly Germany, uh, which I know quite well because my, my wife is German. Um, and in the US, they have a, re a very regulatory planning system, and these are zoning planning systems. Um, and when it comes to producing a plan and working out whether something should be allowed for development, there are often quite uh, yes or no um, forms of assessment that are made. So it's quite an objective, I suppose. I don't really think it's strictly objective because there are values implicit, but it's essentially a straightforward way of making a decision about whether dis a planning planning a development should be allowed. And, and in that sense, I think, and it's what it says down at the bottom there, if I can make it go down, I think that, that might, those kind of systems might suit some form of smart planning a little bit more closely than, than our system, which is what, what we would call a discretionary planning system. And I was looking up discretionary because it's quite a, a big word. And I, it essentially means that um, it's, it's the opposite of a yes, no planning system. We negotiate uh, over a lots of issues that we have written down uh, in our plans uh, to decide if something should get planning permission or not and to be allowed to be developed. Um, and what's really important is that we, we produce plans and we write policies, um, but these policies are confronting both objective and quite subjective issues in some respects. And it's something that our planning system confronts uh, from full on, I suppose. Um, and I worry and I struggle to understand how uh, uh, a smart planning system, whatever that, that might be, might deal with some of these subjective issues, I suppose, which are, which are important to us. And also, therefore, the very political nature of planning uh, as a process as well, which, which is something that we find. So I'll come back to that a little bit more. But essentially, I think some planning systems, these regulatory planning systems, might deal with the issues better. Um, 
And this is a, a slide where I try and explain that it's just a sort of off the top of my head slide. It's not a piece of science, but I think there is some, there is a box over here called smart stuff. There are sorts of ways we can do analysis and ways we can think and uh, ways we can collect data, which which allow us to 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 feel that we're being smart. Um, but for me as a planner, there are a, a large number of planning and design issues which we might struggle to get to to get into that box to make it bigger. If you see what I mean. So, so that's my sort of starting point with this. I'm in a sense a, a little bit yet to be convinced that um, that that the smart city, as it's confidently expressed, really can exist. But um, these are things that are happening or conversations that were happening in our country at the moment. And this is just something that I uh, found this last week in our prof professional planning journal, which started to look at the way in which technologies can be used to help establish uh, a better planning system. Um, and some people might say it's better and some people might just say it's slightly more, slightly different. Um, but it is, it's a sort of discussion which we're having at the moment um with within our professions amongst people who are who are interested in these sorts of issues and um there's a sort of set of principles which is kind of worth worth sort of reflecting on uh, i suppose the sort of way in which technology can be introduced into this complex professional landscape of planning and development in order to make the planning system better um, i'm not going to dwell on all of these points um, but it's 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 all about um, the fact that the community needs to own the technology or control the technology, and there's a lot of issues around ethics in particular that some um, data, um, private data, shouldn't be held and it should be used very carefully, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can imagine, I suppose, the sorts of issues uh, where you're trying to establish a, a, a more digitally uh, controlled system. So yeah, I mean the the debate is going on uh, as we speak. So um, I'm going to see if I can just make this a little bit smaller on the screen. So I was sort of thinking about what um, a smart city uh, is and how it's this, this is expressed and understood by people interested in this topic. And I, I found these circles quite a common uh, feature of the way in which they're presented. And I, I, I like these kind of diagrams. I like anything that kind of tries to bring everything together into one image that tries to explain um, it, it's explain a concept. I do it a little bit myself, or I did when I was a lecturer. It kind of helped me to understand my overall field. So this is a kind of an effort to pull together everything that uh, people think might come under that heading. Um, and on, on the left-hand side, we can see that they're quite similar, actually. They cover very similar themes. Um, and we can start to see this in, in, the, in the reality of our life, I suppose, that a smart city, well, you can't disagree with the fact that we're all going to be smart. It's obviously automatically a good thing. Um, and then somebody says, well, there'll be smart people, there'll be a smart economy, the environment will be smart, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, the language is really significant in, in English, at least. Um, and there are some things that we would recognize here, such as, for example, we can use technologies to make cities safer which is a good thing. Um, and we can use technologies to uh, manage the energy efficiency of uh, properties, which of course is also a very good thing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And on the left-hand side around the, around, the, around the circle, you can see this reference to indicators, which I think is really important within the theory of smart cities that we can actually provide uh, data or evidence, clear evidential sort of survey data that we are being successful. And of course, this is all do also data that we can extract from and put into apps or pieces of technology that, are, that allow, to, allow us to do the thing we want to do. So you can see a kind of science behind the, the notion of the smart city, um, which I'll come back to later on in the talk, um, but should be reasonably familiar with all of us. Um, and on the right hand side is a very similar um, circle, which just expresses similar things in a slightly different way. Um, and so I, I don't need to emphasize it too much. Uh, but but there's something quite um, compelling about the circle. It's kind of, it's almost ideological, I suppose, in the extent that everything is inside that circle and therefore it's kind of a unified vision, I suppose, of, of the nature of a city. Um, for somebody like me, it's who's a little skeptical about the idea of a smart city. It's it's something to, in a sense, challenge, I suppose, and, and be interested in, and, and that's what my my talk will do. Um, 
But what I feel from this is that we can use particularly indicators and technology to uh, embrace small parts or small aspects of the built environment, like the energy efficiency of building or road safety and stuff like that. Um, but in relation to the slide which I showed earlier, I think you know we can. So we this is sort of what this is a circle. This is the circle, and then I've got all of these other issues that I deal with every day, which it might be might be harder to to deal with in this sort of smart way. Um, but it is happening in our city and it's hopefully happening where you're living too in, in these small ways, in these discrete ways. And so here are some of the things that are happening in Cardiff. Um, a smart thing is we're trying to build energy efficient um, social housing. And of course, these ideas have been around for a very long time. And this is just uh, from, the, from our local newspaper on the left hand side. We've got some um, ecologically uh, eco houses, we call them, which are just very, very energy efficient houses being built in a in a Cardiff suburb. And there's a new company called Zero, which is offering a service to the residents of those companies to manage and control how those buildings are heated. So this is a smart technology that allows the the, the computer basically to, to work out how to heat uh, and cool the property uh, and heat running water in the most energy efficient way possible, which, you know, you can't argue about. It's it's a really good a really good thing and hopefully will become more normal practice. Um, in our city as well, we are trying to pr promote what we call active travel, walking and cycling, uh, but we also have problems with our existing road systems. So we're trying to use technologies to firstly manage, uh, for example, traffic lights in the city so we can make uh, traffic go more efficiently through particular areas of the city. So we can actually change the technology in the streets um, but we're also trying to give information via smartphones to people uh, so they can make sensible choices about which might be the best route to take or which might be the quickest bus to take uh, so that um, these, these active travel choices are, are easier for people uh, to make. So that's also a very, uh, obviously a very good thing. You can't uh, argue with that. Um, we have these things called smart parking uh, spaces, again, using technology in this this time built into the street to highlight where people uh, can park. So we have about 60, it says here under the slide, I'm not sure if you can see it, 64,000 communities, uh, people driving into commuters, not communities, commuters driving into the city, which we don't want. But if they do come into the city, they can look at an app and find out where it's easy to park. Um, because each car parking space has a has something that tells tells you if there's a car there, um, so you can drive. You don't need to drive around the city, um, polluting the city in order to find a parking space. Or at least that's the theory, um, which I suppose is a good thing too. Um, and then we've also got things like smart street lights, which, if you remember, I referred referred to safety, um, is a really important thing uh, as you walk through the city that you feel that you're in an illuminated space, but also when you're not there, these are street lights that can be dimmed so they don't use so much energy, uh, which again is a is a discrete small area of, of life which um, helps the city to save money um, and also reduces the impact of that street lighting on nature to a certain extent because we can maintain darker environments uh, in, in particularly in sensitive locations. Um, here we also uh, use smart technologies to collect information um, from our community, from the people that we serve. And this is just a nice example of a, a website or a, a service which the council is using to, to get information about um, where people walk and cycle and the issues that they have along those routes. So if your job is to promote walking and cycling and you want to know why people don't walk and cycle in a particular area, you know, you need to find a way of asking people. And you can see there in the background, all of those red dots are all of the comments in very particular locations um, which show uh, show how many people have responded to this query. Um, and uh, that's really powerful uh, way of allowing people to feel they've contributed to the planning of the city. Um, but it's also really useful information for our engineers who can then go out and make the changes necessary to make it easy to walk or cycle. So again, a great a great opportunity and a great thing to use technology to help people actually become involved in the planning of a city. And that's one example of a number of sorts of technology that, that allow people to do that. Um, I thought I'd put this in because I think it's important. We, we have a GIS system, as I hope 
these days most local authorities will and on that GIS system is is basically a lot of mapped data about our city um, all sorts of category of um, of issue and thing and this is a public uh, this is a public facility so anybody who lives in our city can can look at a map like this see if a house uh, is is historic and protected a monument what we call a listed building or where we have various policies working for flooding or whatever it might be so so this is a kind of shared intelligence uh, which which everybody can look at if they they understand how to use it. I don't suppose many people in Cardiff would know how to use it necessarily, and they, they might need to be educated, but it is there and uh, it's available for all of us to use uh, in the city. And then finally, on this sort of list of things that uh, I was thinking about, um, I'm an urban designer and I'm interested in how public space is used. And you know, if I want to find that out today, I have to go out and stand in a street and, and look at, uh, draw maps and make annotations on a piece of paper to, to study how, how an environment is used. But there are new pieces of technology which allow uh, this to be done using a smart camera, which uh, is being used um, by transport planners uh, in the city to actually study how many pedestrians, how many cars, how many motorbikes or buses use a particular street at different types of day so that's an that's an enormous amount of of useful data um it doesn't tell us how that people feel about using that space or, or it just tells us whether they're there or not so it's a bit of a it's a very discreet piece of information but it again it's a, another way in which we can gather information using technologies which i think is is really useful um and has been discussed uh, as a positive thing so lots of what i would sort of describe as discrete or small um, areas of, of work where, where smart technologies have been helpful and are being embraced and are being used. And the question I suppose Sky asked me when she asked me to do this talk is, am I smart um, in the work that I do? And, and here I have to step away from those technologies and, and think about what I do uh, and why I do it. And I suppose one of my, uh, my job is to really work out if um, the designs that come in for plans for the city are good or not. Um, and so this is just a, a slide, which is a bit of a joke uh, saying, of course, that uh, this doesn't give the architect or the planner, who's me in the background on the left hand side, slightly bald, um, much confidence that it is, this is a good design. But the question is, can smart technology help me to, to make that decision uh, in, a, in a slightly different way? So I need to look really right at, at what at what my job is and what it is I'm trying to do. Um, and this, again, a bit like those circle diagrams, this is a diagram which pulls together in one diagram all of the things that I'm thinking about when I'm either designing a bit of town or looking at somebody else's design for a bit of town. And um, some people say that my job is to create what's called a, in, in English, a sense of place which is um, a very complicated term, but this diagram tries to make it quite straightforward, I suppose, that in any bit of town that I'm planning or designing, I'm interested in the activities that might occur. Uh, if you remember all of those cars and buses and pedestrians walking through a place, etc., that's kind of an example of that. Um, I'm looking at the physical space in which those activities will be located, the buildings, the streets, uh, the public spaces. And I'm also responsible for and reacting to the meanings that people give to those uh, those activities and physical settings too. And outside that triangle, you can then see some of the subheadings that uh, I suppose I have to think about and deal with. And if you were doing a degree in, in urban design, you would learn a little bit about all of these things and, and how you need to, do, to design and think about them. Um, I suppose the question is, could you, uh, if I just skip back up to that slide, with, with the circles on it, uh, could we find indicators, reasonable indicators for um, all of these things? Well, um, I don't think you could necessarily um, for some of the meanings that people associate with, with places and also some of the qualities that are associated with a physical setting um, in particular. It's quite interesting, to, uh, an interesting challenge. Um, it sort of goes beyond, in a sense, uh, what we would be, what we would, we would poss possibly want to do um, but there are some things we could certainly uh, quantify and express uh, through indicators for sure. So that's, it's the question is what, what you're losing or what you're missing when, when, you, when you start to choose what you focus on because being smart is what you're trying to be. Um, 
we uh, have a lot of uh, government documents uh, which try and summarize what we what I would call the principles of urban design um, which if again if you are learning my field and designing a bit of city it's a kind of reminder a list of of all of the things that you should think about when you're judging uh, a bit of town um, and again I don't plan to go through all of this because it's much too much for this brief talk it's not it's not the point but um, we're interested in this thing called character. This is, again, this is the term I use, sense of place and history, um, that places are special, um, that they are linked into local culture and traditions. And this is point number one. It's a very strong theme in British planning. If you come to Britain, you can see it in the different places that there, there's a lot of character in the countryside, uh, in the towns and villages, and also in different parts of the city. And we have to manage uh, that character and develop it into the future. So. But then also quality of public spaces, whether people can find their way around, whether they will be getting lost, um, whether there is a diversity of, of, of life and uses all within walking distance, the sort of 20 minute city or the 10 minute city from, from where people live. Um, a built form uh, thing and the quality and enclosure of streets and public spaces, how easy it is to move and how easy it will be for that environment to change. These are all things that I should be thinking about. Um, and underneath, there are some of the issues that uh, I would look at in a bit more detail. Um, again, how many of those could you really confidently say you could develop clear indicators for? Yes or no, we've achieved it. No, we haven't. Some of the, some of the issues are quite complex. Um, and there are some big themes, big public policy themes, which are and issues which form a context to my work. So whilst I'm designing buildings and streets, I have to think about a quite complex set of um, policy agendas, if I can call that, that the national government says I should be thinking about. And these, these are common. And sometimes there are indicators associated with these, uh, these particular areas. So health and well-being, for example, we want people to be healthy. And we can we can kind of measure that, can't we? Because the body, you know, we can we can look at numbers of people in hospital, etc. Um, so we know that active travel makes people healthier; they can walk and cycle more. So that's a good thing. So then I have to design bits of town to allow that to happen. Um, biodiversity uh, is obviously also important these days, very critically, and is a priority for us as a, as a planning service. Every scheme that comes into us has to show or demonstrate how it improves the biodiversity of the place where it's proposed for. And again, we can we can measure that, I suppose. We can see if it's better or worse. Um, slightly more complicated, we're obviously trying to promote sustainable development. And we have, like everywhere else, a very established sense that this is both economic, social, and environmental sustainability, which links back to biodiversity. We're trying to promote quality of life for people, that every development should lead to improvement of quality of life for, for the whole community, or for as many people in the community as possible, but also for choices in their lifestyles as well. <clears throat> it's a very liberal idea, but I think it's important. Um, we're trying to promote equality, to make sure that the poorest people in our society um, feel the benefits of development, which I think in Britain we're not always very good at. It depends on the, the government in power at the time, but it is something which we're encouraged to think about. And of course, down here, we've got whether something looks beautiful or attractive or stimulating or interesting. Um, and also we're trying to look after our heritage and significant spaces and places so that um, people feel that strong sense of attachment to a place that, uh, that they can call their own, I suppose. So, Again, it's very complicated, isn't it? Planning tries to embrace all of these things. And even a small scheme, uh, we have to go through all of these issues to judge whether um, we are making a decision that supports uh, these issues as they're relevant to that site. Um, so lots of, lots of different issues. Um, also lots of different people involved with development um, who, are, who all have their own measures for what constitutes success. So each measures their success differently. And I'm quite deliberate in, in using that term. Um, so any piece of land will have a landowner who probably wants to, well, they have, sometimes they have quite mixed goals, but often they just want to make a lot of money, to be very frank. And they have funders as well, the banks, the pension funds who fund development, probably also keen to maximize a return on that site. We've got developers, who obviously are interested uh, to deliver an interesting scheme and meet market demand. And then we've got me as a planner with a rich set of objectives. 
uh, and a highway engineer who's probably mainly interested in making sure that traffic moves properly. Um, we've got architects, urban designers, but also critically, this very complex group of people over on the right, um, the everyday in users of an environment. Um, and we all have slightly different goals. Um, everyday users, uh, a very rich set of, of, of views about what development might involve. This is just a diagram which tries to explain um, the different amounts of power that all of those people have in the development process um, and, and how you know, I suppose the planning process is supposed to make sure that everybody has has been able to express some kind of involvement in the process. But still, it's absolutely the case that the people on the left here are the most powerful players uh, in that process, um, and and that affects how smart we can be. Quite literally, how much how much control will these people give over to other players in this process to try and to try and influence outcomes is is a big part of my job because I have to make sure that these people are responding to the people on the the, the concerns of the people on the right these people respond to the people who are concerned on the right so yeah again complicated uh, and interesting very interesting but not always I'm afraid very smart <laughs> um, and then even within my own authority, when we get a planning application, this is a diagram which I produced a while ago for, for another presentation. And it just shows all of the people um, and the professions involved in thinking about development. And each of them has their own concerns and their own, again, way of measuring success. Um, and uh, I, I am only one small player in my authority. This is me, Urban Design here, um, involved in looking at and thinking about schemes. Um, I'm interested in a lot of aspects of schemes, whereas, for example, my tree officer colleague, who's very, very good, is, is only interested in whether the trees will survive and grow. So he, that he would have quite an easy yes or no response to the question. Um, but uh, some of some other people have much more complicated uh, jobs, I suppose, and are trying to promote quite complex uh, objectives. Um, and we we come into um, we come into the, that negotiation which I talked about earlier. In, in all of the scenarios where planning applications are being considered. And the big ones are much, much more complicated than the small ones. So the big planning applications, everybody would become involved and the small one, maybe just the people inside the inner circle would become involved. But it's complicated. And sometimes, again, it's, it's not always very smart. Um, we have to be very, very careful about how we make sure different people are, different people's issues are, are, are dealt with. And sometimes the tree officer isn't happy because the tree does get chopped down. Um, so he would say that's not very smart. Whereas I'd say, well, yeah, but we managed to plant three more trees. So um, maybe I'm happier. So anyway, um, I'm just a bit conscious of time and I just need to be aware that I, I always talk a bit slower than I meant to, but um, no I work, is that okay? I, just, okay. <laughs> I work across various scales again. And you have to kind of choose what scale you're interested in. So I design bits of a neighborhood, um, uh, the whole neighborhood, uh, uh, bits of places of a neighborhood, streets of housing, et cetera, uh, grouped together to create bits of town. And also, um, therefore, how the, the house fits into a, into a street. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But I, I work across various scales. And again, that creates its own complexity, I suppose, because different issues are relevant at, at different scales. But at the same time, we need to be able to think between them all of the time, which is a very interesting aspect of my job, um, but does make it difficult uh, to work out how we could think through how to make that exactly smart all of the time. I would call it a designerly way of thinking. I think like a designer um, between those scales all of the time. So to give you an example, just so you can imagine a, a real bit of town, um, this is our biggest scheme which we've dealt with, which is a huge extension to Cardiff. And here I am planning with my ecology colleague. Remember, I was sort of showing you tree officers and ecologists, et cetera, working with me. We're looking at how we accommodate the um, ecological connectivity, which we know we need to, to have through um, this new area of Cardiff. So the, the white areas are, are new, going to be the new housing areas, which will have houses built on them and other, other uses and facilities. So we're looking at the green infrastructure, what we call the green infrastructure and how that will be connected together. So we are making some of these corridors wider in quite simple terms, 60 meters wide, so that um, so that the ecology that lives in, in, in different areas could travel through the environment along dark corridors. Sorry, I'm trying to make the map go down, but I'll just leave it like that. Um, to, to other areas so, so that the, the ecology can thrive, which is something we know from research about, about how eco ecology can work in cities in, in an efficient way. 
Um, so again, that's me working at the highest level and thinking in a designerly way with an ecologist about how we can make improvements to a piece of town. Then I work with my highway engineering colleagues and we look at how we can go into those white areas and structure up the pattern of access for public transport, for walking and cycling and for car drivers as well. So we have lots of ideas about how the networks might be built to, to be efficient for walking and cycling in particular, and maybe less direct for people who are choosing to drive. Um, and we also then work, you see on the right hand side, uh, ideas about the sections of these streets so that we can accommodate all of the things that we want to accommodate in those areas and think about the character of those spaces as well as, as, as pieces of public realm. Um, so yeah, so working at a high level, but also going into a little bit of or a lot of detail about some of those spaces again at the same time. Um, we then, for example, would look at uh, the specific areas within that huge housing area. That's about 5,000 homes uh, altogether, I think. Uh, and we're trying to work out how to divide the, that big area into smaller, what we call character areas. Remember I referred to character earlier. Um, so that this doesn't feel like one big housing uh, estate or one big housing area, but it does vary and change as you pass through it. Um, so we're, we're coming up with ideas for, for how that uh, how that might happen in plan form, but also then thinking through in some detail what, what each of these different colours might mean. If you want to build housing uh, in one area or another, what you might have to do slightly differently. Um, we're thinking as well about where centres might be located, the so-called walkable city um, or the 20 minute neighbourhood or however you want to express it. They're all essentially um, neighbourhood concept ideas which have been around for a very long time. Um, so we're trying to work out where we might locate other facilities, shops, schools. Um, we don't have many religious buildings being built, but that might be something in, in a relevant culture, etc. So and making sure then that people can walk and cycle to those facilities um, as easy as possible. And this is the, the big center in the scheme which we're looking at here, which we had to work out where to put it. Um, and then we zoom in, we go into the scale, go in another level of scale, and we start to think about um, how that center itself should be planned. Um, and this is a very, all of those planning and design issues which I talked about earlier are then come to into play as we start to look at different ways in which we can think about different aspects of this centre. So this is a, a map that just shows the, the uses that will go into that centre and how they might be arranged um, into the streets and public spaces. But there are other maps that show the, the, for example, the tram system and how that might be accommodated, how you walk and walk and cycle and how you connect out to the network, how big the buildings might be, et cetera. Um, these are all themes and issues common to, to urban design and planning from all around the world. And it, it's just how we deal with them in, in, a, in a British context. And that, that will then get uh, planning permission. Um, and then we'll look at um, work up with a developer uh, who has, as I said, their own goals in relation to this and the landowner, um, a, a scheme for that bit of town, which, um, which we feel conforms with, with, with our goals and our aspirations. Um, and as a rich, you can see all those annotations around it, there's a rich set of ideas at work here in terms of what we're trying to achieve um, as planners and designers and, and landowners and architects, et cetera. Um, we hope that we'll come to some kind of consensus and be happy collectively with what we're proposing. Um, then I go in uh, again, well, I'm still at the same scale, aren't I? So these are ideas for how we can make make what I call good built form and good townscape. So when you're in a bit of this housing area, you can see different sorts of public space. Uh, you get sort of key views, which which may be where the housing slightly changes in relation to the context, or maybe we've got a nice view out to the context. So we've got some ways of analyzing any any piece of land and thinking about how we can make a, a, a new housing area that sits comfortably on that on that land. And so these are some of the issues that um, that I would encourage planners uh, and developers building housing to, to think through. And we'll discuss that on each individual site. And then we go in and look at the actual houses and the designs of the streets in quite a lot of detail. So um, again, working through the scale and, and looking at uh, a wide range of issues as we go from from a very wide scale all of the way down to how, what the what the windows on a house might look like. It's a, a very diverse job, um, but hopefully we're pulling into those different decisions all of the theory, I suppose, if you remember, uh, which I showed you earlier back up here, all of the issues that we should be thinking about um, when we do our work and if we do it properly. 
Um, I wanted to step back and, and just think about theory because um, it's, it's useful to go from windows and streets and um, types of use to think about what it is we're trying to do. And um, this is just something I've always found useful for me when I've thought about uh, what it is and why I, what, what it is I do and why I do planning in the way that I do. Um, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is quite a common, um, common way of explaining things in planning, uh, but I think is important. Um, we're trying to meet human needs in our work, which is, this is Maslow's hierarchy, basically emphasizing the importance of physiological needs, uh, but, but then also going up a hierarchy to embrace things like um, esteem, um, status, recognition, strength, freedom. Uh, again, these, these are quality of life issues, um, self-actualization, um, the desire to become the most that one can be. Uh, you know, we're trying to, through, through, our, through our creating of new spaces where people will live and live their lives, we're trying to make sure that people will have, be able to achieve all of these things uh, through their life. And some of these relate directly to issues that we've talked about today, like safety needs. You know, will you be able to walk down a, a street with street lights at night and, and feel safe? So we can make that kind of link quite carefully and closely. Um, I added a bottom to the triangle, which is called nature and environmental processes, because Maslow wasn't so interested in ecology. And I think that today we know that underpinning all of our human needs is the need for ecology, for ecology and nature to, to thrive and be as good as it can be. And um, for me, it's really smart, I suppose, to, to be able to, to map on to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, um, all of those principles which I talked about uh, earlier um, from you know, fundamental issues about like bio, bio, biodiversity and ecological systems and drainage, um, all of the way to whether things look beautiful uh, and provide people with a stimulating rich uh, environment uh, and can personalize their home um, by changing the color of their front door, whatever it is, and all of those things in between as well, privacy uh, and amenity, a feeling of being safe, um, the ability to travel uh, and get to where you need to go to as well as possible. So I think through our work, this is me mapping what I'm trying to do onto Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I think that's a smart thing to try and to try and do, I suppose, in general terms. So I feel confident that I'm covering all of the issues that I should. And then um, moving on again, I think um, I reflect a little bit uh, on, on how smart we can be. And uh, this is another thing that I just wanted to introduce to, to the conversation, which is um, a sort of people who think about the nature of planning problems, as I've tried to explain. Um, and there's a, a very useful article which you should read if you haven't already. It's quite uh, old, I suppose, uh, from 1973, 1973. And there's a series of articles actually by Whittle and Whittle and Weber, Rittle, sorry, and, and Weber um, about uh, the sorts of problems that planning tries to solve. Um, and, and really, as I've tried to describe today in my own work, the sorts of issues and problems that I, th I throw. Um, and I've just highlighted a bit of text in the abstract, which is very straightforward um, and explains, in a sense, the issue for me. Um, I'll just read this out. The search for scientific bases for confronting problems of social policy um, is bound to fail because of the nature of these problems. Uh, they're wicked, they, they describe them as wicked problems, uh, whereas science has de developed to, to deal with tame, tame problems or problems that the scientists themselves can tame. And it struck me that, you know, I deal with wicked problems, and I'll explain this a little bit in a minute, but I deal with wicked problems in my daily life. All of those people and all of those goals and all of those ways of making assessments about whether it's good or not, whether it should get planning permission or not, is essentially a very complex and wicked kind of problem to solve. And it, it struck me that maybe smart thinking would be trying to tame some of those problems um, in ways that cannot be done. So I, 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 I changed uh, the text and sort of said, the search for a smart way of confronting problems in social policy or planning um, is bound to fail because of the nature of these problems, which is, is what I've essentially tried to, to, show, to show you today, that in, in some respects, you might be able to solve discrete problems like how to make a house uh, uh, be heated efficiently or how to deal with street lighting so that it's um, energy efficient and it gets brighter when somebody's walking past. But some of the problems that I deal with as a planner are much more complicated than that, much less easy to, to control. Um, and, and we need to find ways of dealing with that too. 
Um, wicked problems are really importantly not not reducible to labor laboratory conditions. They're not cause and effect problems. They are what we would call real world problems. Uh, and I think as a planner, I deal with and I enjoy dealing with those real world that real world complexity. And Rittle and Wed in those articles explain various qualities of of wicked problems. And these are just some of them. So the easiest way to understand this is to go and read the articles. But for example, one, one problem uh, solved for one person might lead to another. So, you know, if you're if you're interested in economic development, you've you've just secured development for for, for a development of 30,000 jobs, but it's built being built on a, an ecologically sensitive location, then you know you've you've created jobs, but you've destroyed the environment in the process. And planning is all about confronting those sorts of tensions all of the time. Um, very, very true uh, in planning terms, every problem is essentially unique. Every site that I deal with is different. Every community that I deal with is has similar qualities, uh, but, but also is quite different. Um, so, you know, it's not possible always to generalize about everything that we do. Um, and then slightly more difficult, I suppose, every problem is a symptom of another problem and the choice of explanation um, directs the problem solution. So I suppose if you're interested in wicked uh, sorry, not wicked. If you're interested in smart problems, then what you'll do, or smart solutions, then you'll try and make the problem something that you can sol solve with a smart piece of technology. So you might be denying, in a sense, the nature of the problem a little bit if you're not if you're not careful. Um, so yes, the planning problems I deal with, and the planning process is set up to deal with. It deals with wicked problems, um, and smart solutions might not always fit. Um, just to emphasize that very quickly, because I'm mindful of time. Um, there are some big themes in planning which come through, which show how people might judge things differently all of the time. So we have people who are concerned about the environment, what I would call eco-centrists, who try and make sure that uh, ecology and biodiversity are good uh, and dealt with well, and that we promote active travel, et cetera. And they are principally concerned to protect and enhance biodiversity in the environment. There is something called community centrism as well, which is sort of, we, we sometimes call these uh, a kind of nimbyism. It's a term we use in English, people who object to development occurring in their backyards, not in my backyard people. Um, and these are people who believe strongly in community involvement um, and dealing with uh, local issues in a local way. So we must make sure we must do what the community wants. Um, there are people who think the planning system is there to deliver jobs and growth, and uh, I would put under this heading master plans and promote economic development. Um, and, I, I, and, and there's often a, a strong conflict in planning decisions between these different perspectives on any particular problem. Um, and so you, I'm not sure smart planning would over, ever overcome that necessarily. Um, and I, I actually suggested that maybe smart planning might also be uh, a, a way of, of, of thinking about planning in its own way, which which would add a new sort of focus. Um, uh, you know, if you can't measure it, then, then then it's not important. Was what I wrote down here, and, I, and of course, I think it is, these issues need to be thought about quite carefully. Um, two slides left. Um, it doesn't matter how smart a scheme is, and this is a nice example of that. This is a scheme I showed you earlier. Um, people didn't want it uh, because again they come from their own perspectives and they have their own views on on schemes um, so it doesn't matter how smart a scheme is uh, in your own terms if if the local population see other issues with it that they don't want then uh, they might try and resist it so this is the this is a newspaper report new eco homes face stiff opposition from youth residents in cardiff they just don't want these houses in their community um, they do have planning permission and they are being built and they look very nice but you know the planning system had to deal with that complexity and i think it did Smart, smart planning would maybe wouldn't have resolved that. And my final slide, um, just a summary really. I think smart, smart technologies offer discrete areas and can help plan and manage in particular aspects of our environment. I think that's really useful. It's a very important thing. Um, but, um, and, and also that some types of planning system, not necessarily our planning system in the UK, but some types of planning systems, zoning planning systems, regulatory planning systems, might be able to embrace approaches to smart planning better. Um, 
but we need to think about the full range of issues that we as planners are trying to 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 think through when we're when we're planning a city and i know you're looking at and doing this a little bit with, in relation to this topic uh, which is interesting but we need to understand that planning problems are sometimes quite wicked um, and quite difficult to to solve using um, strictly sci scientific ways of thinking i suppose Um, and my final point is that a lot of my job involves decisions that are political um, and should be supported by democratic processes and decision makers. Ultimately, planning, I suppose, is a is a democratic process where people have been elected to make decisions, particularly about the big schemes that uh, affect an area. And sorry about the fact that I've had to present it like that, but thanks for listening. Well, thank you, Mike, very much. I think it was quite interesting overview from like the helicopter view of how you know, from the planning perspective, you get into the, like really detailed design and then all the different professions get involved after the big master plan scheme or during the master plan scheme as well. Yeah. And I really liked your ideas when you said that, what do we lose by eliminating mm. the things when we try to make the things more smarter? And, uh, <laughs> and how do we measure the things that are unmeasurable? And that's mm. what um, Haiyan, one of the participants, is um, writing her thesis, how to apply all those urban design principles that are mm. really unmeasurable, how mm. to find the way how to measure them and transform them into a digital twin or digital pla planning uh, system. And obviously, mm. we should admit that some of them, they are not measurable, like memories or like meaning of the place. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this is so only purely emotional. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would go further than that. And I'd say it's a, 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 <laughs> I, I think it's hard to, to set out to do that type of topic. I've seen I've seen bits of software that will design cities. Um, and uh, I suppose that they, you know, they're sort of trying to replace me from from the process. Um, but they're also trying to replace all of those other people who may have a view about what should or shouldn't be done in a place. And my day job, when I when I finish sitting here, I will go and look at bits of land and, and work out with a whole range of people how that land might be used. And often there's a whole set of solutions that might be appropriate and that might work and that might um, benefit different people in different ways. Um, and I think it's important that that, that people remain at the centre of, of those decisions. Um, and and that I think one of the, the challenges of a piece of work, thinking about smart cities is to determine where where you stop really, <laughs> if that makes sense. So um, there are there are just some things that need to be done by people um, in a in what I would describe as a designerly or creative way, but but not necessarily. You need to establish a process that is systematic through which decisions can be made in a in a transparent and honest way, um, because. We don't always get what we want, any of us in the planning and development process, but we do need to understand why we failed and I think or, or haven't achieved our goals, but but uh, maybe that would be hidden inside smart technology and, and it might be appropriated by powerful people, as I tried to express, to, to get their way and, and other people who are less powerful might might lose control. So this is where I'm nervous around the ideas associated with smart city that the, the, the technology or the ideas can be appropriated and, and used against certain other groups possibly uh, but uh, yeah i i feel as a designer that um that uh, it, it's a it's a challenge to to what i do and how i do it yeah okay do we have any questions from the audience i hope people have said where they're sitting i want to look at this later on but yeah, yeah. they did <laughs> great <laughs> well does anyone would like to ask any questions Okay, um, there's Said asking the question. So now, is it smart? But the way of thinking and to identify the problem of the smartness. So, do you want to try? Do, do you want to try and ask that, Said? Can you put your microphone on and, and ask me? Yes. Hello. Hello, Professor. Hi. Good morning. Oh. Uh, because at the beginning, my question, like at the beginning, you said it's not a smart. So. Yeah. Not so smart. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so I, I was confused, like, is it or it is not? So now after the presentation, I understood how how to be smart for that, mm -hmm. like not as smart as uh, the only beauty, beauty and so on. So now the smart to identify the problem and to find the way of smartness. Is it right? So I think, I think 
there, there's a slide in there's a, some slides in in my presentation which show some circles where people have tried mm -hmm. to outline um, what you can what what might be included in in smartness <laughs> if you can say that and, yeah. and some of those some of those uh, issues are things that that you can readily measure so for example energy efficiency or sunlight or you know things that are uh, basically have a sort of a natural science basis you can also start to possibly create indicators for all sorts of things where I would start to query it, such as whether people like a view or not, or whether they think something is beautiful. Like everybody can give something a mark out of 10 if they find it a, be a good piece of coursework might get a higher mark, but it's not, a, it's not a really objective science. It's a subjective assessment to which a number is being given. But there are some things where you can essentially say, we have a really reasonably clear view as a result of this work that um, that uh, it is better or worse as a result of what we're doing. And, and those are things where I think you could possibly say, and I call these discrete things, these are small tasks where you can use technology, for example, to, to, to make an improvement to, to most people's lives. So for example, you can, you can create, as I tried to show, for example, a, a, a street light, which goes goes lighter or darker depending on whether people are walking past and that's smart because it allows a council like mine where I work to save money from lighting for when there are no people around you know that strikes me as a very obvious small area of work where we can make a significant improvement because it's just cheaper to put up lights like that we can use that technology but some of the problems that I face and have to deal with don't allow that way of thinking they are too complex they are too wicked um, and I worry that people who are talking about smart cities um, are missing some of that complexity when they try and turn everything into a smart solution. I personally don't think you can do that. I think if you came and worked in our office and you sat down with the people I sit opposite and we said, right, we're going to create a piece of technology that will allow us to solve these problems, they'd just laugh at me and say I'm being naive. Um, but we will be able to put in these smart street lights. That's OK. So I, I think that there are some areas and maybe you need to work out where the boundaries are in your workshop. There are some areas where we won't really be very smart uh, in the future. We can't be. <laughs> that's my view. At the moment, that's my view until, until other pe people convince me otherwise. <laughs> okay. Uh, completely understood. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, are there any more questions from the audience? Okay, I will ask the last one. Um, okay. So based on like your presentations and the views that you're giving to the students, so shall we say that basically we should follow the classical principles of what our disciplines or what our professions are teaching us and then mm. add on top of that uh, a level of the technology that yeah. can bring those things a little bit more advanced and integrate into like that technological smartness level? I think that's right. I mean, when when I look at when I look at the smart technologies that are being introduced in my city or across Britain, then I can see I, I can automatically see the benefits that they bring. So, for example, I've got a, I, as we've all got, I've got a phone these days that will help me to come and see you by the most efficient route. And that's a discrete problem. And it's a fabulous thing to be able to use a, a tool really to make to make my life better and to make our lives better because, you know, you buy me dinner and it would be lovely to see you. But um, so those are those are areas where we can make improvements. And there are bits of technology which I, I didn't have time to talk about, which will which will show me, for example, how to make an efficient route where pedestrians walk and cycle in a, in a most direct way. I can do that in my head by designing it, but sometimes it's reassuring to have that technology to to model an area and to explain. Uh, so those those tools exist already. Um, but I think that there are also then um, from within our own fields or within your own fields, a, a sense that maybe there's a limit to how far you can go in that. And so I, I would encourage you to do that. You know, if you're an architect, what would a smart building be like? Well, there, there is the infrastructure and there is the technology, but you also want that sense of delight and wonder and joy, and you want it to sit in its context quite well. So maybe as an architect, you'd have a slightly different view about how far it can go. Um, but, but what I would encourage you to do is, is define those boundaries uh, quite clearly and, and start to be obvious, start to be honest about how far this concept can go. I, I, I worry that, I think people get excited by the idea of smartness and they define themselves as maybe a smart planner and they are losing um, 
other aspects of their job in the process, which they should be taking more seriously in, in the way that they define themselves as so-called smart. It's <laughs> hard to argue with in English, at least everybody wants to be smart, but sometimes I don't think that smart people are actually being very smart. <laughs> That's true. That's if very that makes true. Sense. <laughs> sometimes being practical is more efficient. Yeah, than being maybe, smart. maybe, yeah. yeah. Or, yeah. or acknowledging the complexity of the challenges that we face. I think we have to be very honest about it. Okay. Thank you, Mike, very much. And we're really glad to have you this morning starting the lecture sessions. So somebody's asked a question though, which is quite interesting. Do I, do I think that design can be smart without it being an electric, electronic technology? I, I think a lot of the narrative or a lot of the conversation about smartness is, 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 to, do with, uh, is to do with using various forms of technology. So in, in a sense, no, I don't. I, but it's, there's going to be a, a technological element in, in most of these elements. Um, if I talk about being smart as a person, I mean, it's something slightly different. It just means intelligent or sensible or so. Yes, we can be smart as people, but I do think that when we're talking about this theme, it does involve technology in some way or another. That's my understanding of it. So if you if you find differently, then I, that would be interesting to find out about. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Christopher. OK, so thank you, Mike. Okay, it's nice. I better get back to my day job. Okay, and if the students will have any questions. Can I pass your email so they could? Ask? Yeah, of course. Feel free. That's uh, no problem. It'd be uh, nice to nice to nice to hear from you all. And good luck with your studies. And uh, thanks for inviting me to be part of this. Likewise. Thank you. Bye bye, Michael. Bye. Take care. Okay, I can see that Victoria is already here, but we didn't have the chance to have a break. So maybe let's have a quick five minute break so Victoria can grab a cup of coffee and we can just. A refresh as well and we will start in five minutes so it will be 25 past okay A little bit um, different, uh, different uh, shifts as we are talking through uh, social position, through community, through creative industries. Because if we talk about objects that are material, architecture, um, uh, system of lightning of the city, uh, we can't imagine uh, uh, anything else uh, while talking about smart as. Uh, some electronic support and electronic devices that would make changes. But while we talk about uh, uh, about communities, uh, uh, we can already uh, already use terms smart uh, in the places where, as um, as previous presenter said, that we don't uh, speak about a person in this case as smart. We say that he or she is intelligent. But while we speak about community, so some parts of uh, interaction. Uh, uh, where we talk about smart, but uh, uh, but to start with this, uh, uh, we must uh, start with some uh, uh, key notions and to understand uh, understand um, uh, the uh, the players uh, of uh, of the field and what are that players and uh, how we may deal with them. 
so first thing that um, I would like to um, to take your attention and what is very interesting. So the uh, most interesting thing that we are observing. So the change uh, in the way we understand what is uh, uh, creative uh, industries and. Uh, uh, when the term started uh, in uh, late um, uh, 20th century, while talking about creative industries, we were rather uh, talking about uh, uh, big, uh, uh, big organizations creating uh, cultural products, uh, which developed. And it uh, developed um, uh, through understanding that they can be small, but it started with uh, making lists uh, where on the list they were putting so what can be this creative industry? Maybe film industries enter, architecture enters, of course, music industries. But uh, then there was um, no exact explanation. What, what does it mean? And uh, why? Why it is uh, this difference while we have a cultural sector, while at the same time uh, there was emergence uh, of term uh, cultural industries. And through those discussions, uh, it started um, uh, it started search of uh, what is, <coughs> I'm sorry, particular for, for the organization that we can call creative uh, industry. And uh, this way it went to, uh, to some particular aspect that of course uh, has a great interaction with, uh, uh, with uh, art and design that uh, great understanding of creative industries uh, uh, went to understanding that um, it's not just a cultural product. It has to have a, a feature which um, uh, which allows uh, allows um, uh, and supports commercialization of symbols. So uh, if we would go to uh, just a general uh, um, field of uh, culture, field of cultural production, usually we were going to understanding that uh, yes, they create arts, but do not necessarily create new symbols. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, we've lost your slides. Yeah, I hide them. <laughs> I, oh, okay. that, uh, I shouldn't always uh, show them, but when I'll talk on the next uh, point, so I'll return to the slides. And um, um, uh, because I sometimes I think that we should concentrate on words, not only on what we see in schemes. Uh, so for me, it's uh, very important in this point to stress uh, in this place that uh, uh, not always creating cultural product to create new symbols. So for uh, so when we talk about um, uh, creative industries, the essential part uh, is that this uh, new product must uh, uh, must create symbol. Uh, through development, uh, one more important point emerged, which is uh, very important to our today topic to smart uh, thing and to. Uh, to communities, so uh, I, oh no, that was the fourth one. So the third one was uh, very important, uh, which was noticed uh, that really when we talk about um, creative industries, we talk about uh, interaction of two things that uh, the um, product of cultural industries is a hybrid product that has both material and um, symbolic uh, parts uh, and dimensions, let's say, uh, sometimes we have, uh, if compare and look on architecture, so sometimes we have uh, buildings that uh, we may like or dislike, uh, but they do not have symbolic meaning. Sometimes a building is constructed uh, as a symbol, so uh, this way we would think that, uh, well, while uh, uh, while governments uh, uh, economically uh, constructing this understanding uh, and uh, drawing lines between uh, regular industries and uh, creative industries, they were rather putting uh, lists. Uh, so uh, here we have this difference that uh, not necessarily if we go to, um, if we are heading to find what is a smart uh, aspect uh, in this field that uh, uh, not only materially nice things should be, but it uh, has to carry some symbolic meaning. And the last uh, point in this um, development of a notion where I uh, wanted to say that this is uh, uh, starts to be uh, uh, relating uh, uh, with um, 
uh, with community and heading to smart communities. So if previously, while we, talking, while we were talking about creative industries, we were focusing uh, very much on the product. So in contemporary, in contemporary social sciences, now we are focusing uh, not that much on the product, but much more on the process, which uh, uh, includes uh, networking. So in fact, if we want um, to relate creative uh, industries to, uh, to smart city, we must say that uh, what is important, so it's not, not only important what they create, but for us, it's always very important that we see the places uh, where people from um, uh, cultural in, uh, forum creative industries gather and are active. Let's say this way we may see uh, different hubs that usually have very big influence. And uh, uh, in different cities, we may find the examples where uh, non-functioning, um, uh, non-functioning um, um, different industrial plants uh, that are not used in contemporary society anymore are given, are given as place for hubs for creative industries, are given as uh, maker spaces for creative industries. And uh, this way it uh, makes uh, uh, those districts uh, more interesting, uh, more attracting people. Um, to be true, I don't know whether in reality now you are in Lithuania or are joining on Zoom from different towns. Uh, Skirmanta, do you know students are here? Yes, they are here and they are from everywhere around the world. So we, yeah, but if, from... uh, if you are here, so uh, I, I guess that uh, you had um, taken quite uh, some walks uh, through Vilnius uh, and oh, uh, oh by this one sorry they will be from the 28th of uh, March in here okay great so uh, so you had time to walk through Vilnius uh, so in uh, uh, not uh, center not from center of Vilnius we had uh, such a big district where there were uh, plants and um, when uh, the industry start to change. Uh, those uh, buildings weren't useful anymore. And it looked like uh, uh, ghost districts of uh, concrete buildings that were not used for anything, maybe for some storage. And um, uh, one of the first, uh, one of the first uh, such uh, um, places that made at the same time uh, uh, cultural hub uh, interaction and uh, cultural uh, uh, center place. So it was, and if you uh, if you will walk uh, through that part, so it is uh, uh, art factory lofters. So when they started to, to construct their activities uh, in previously uh, previously industrial district, it started uh, to have very different uh, symbolic meaning in itself. Uh, so that's why for us it's important that uh, when we talk about contemporary creative industries, uh, we include, um, include networking and networking, uh, uh, which, um, uh, which is very important with, uh, with communities. And uh, if previously uh, the final product was main sign that you are uh, part of creative industries, so now we may say that uh, sometimes we don't need to have a product. Sometimes we uh, may create a new tradition. We may create a new habits for community. And uh, that's enough to call uh, that activity creative uh, industry because that's what uh, we are looking for. Uh, and um, uh, heading uh, further. Uh, what are the main uh, tendencies uh, that uh, we may see? So from the very beginning, we had that creative industries uh, were working with arts and popular culture. Um, they were making uh, new symbolic meanings. Uh, they were making uh, new products. Uh, but uh, when we go to, uh, to contemporary understanding, and especially when we talk about impact on the city, so we go to cross uh, sectoral transfer. So if we would go to very similar and uh, very simple and uh, maybe uh, maybe not new examples, but they are very um, they allow to illustrate very much. So let's say when we have a Walt Disney Company, 
uh, we have uh, related toys, we have related uh, uh, interior design things. So that means cross-sectoral. So <coughs> when we uh, when we have uh, uh, those activities in other creative uh, industries, so we may see that some activities uh, that um, uh, were taking uh, uh, part uh, uh, inside or were just um, uh, just created as uh, pieces of art, uh, they start to become uh, become elements of uh, of urbanistic uh, urbanistic development. So. In city, we go to this just cross-sectoral uh, transfer, but uh, as well, we may see uh, we may see cafes that uh, are um, not uh, just cafes, but uh, include possibility uh, for hubbing uh, that uh, have uh, interior design uh, that allows exhibitions and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, main shifts uh, that we see now and that are uh, very much uh, heading to those uh, uh, smart dimensions. So first of them, it's uh, dematerialization and uh, digitalization. So of course, some uh, uh, some aspects, I guess, are difficult uh, difficult to dematerialize, uh, digitalize. Yes, when we speak, uh, and what uh, colleague before me was talking. Um, so yes, if we want. Uh, uh, to make um, to make a town or city interactive, we have to have uh, electronic equipments that help us. Uh, but uh, on the same time, in uh, uh, in contemporary creative industries, so we see uh, lots of things that are completely dematerialized. Not just uh, uh, digital elements added, uh, uh, but let's say in contemporary shift. Uh, now what is raising quite a lot of questions it is uh, nft where we can discuss whether it is uh, still fashion uh, whether it's a new form of uh, currency and uh, uh, whether it is uh, uh, art so when we go to those uh, dematerialized uh, uh, and uh, uh, digitalized creations of creative industries we may notice that um, um, although, although they, of course, uh, are not and uh, uh, most likely never will be, will be fully digitalized, so still we have we need material products to use, uh, and those material products uh, have to include symbolic meanings. Uh, but uh, on uh, another hand, uh, development uh, of uh, all these processes uh, in the uh, digital world uh, became. Uh, became uh, very important. So those, uh, those interactions, they uh, add the possibilities uh, for, for smart communities that uh, are not uh, only material all the time. And uh, uh, one more process that already mentioned in, um, in, uh, in transformation of, uh, of the notion, it is uh, community processes. Uh, so I think uh, in this place uh, would be uh, very important now to ask uh, you one question. So I would like to ask, uh, do you notice in the towns where you uh, regularly study, not in Vilnius, uh, some processes uh, that um, uh, make uh, interaction of community with arts and with uh, uh, neighboring uh, creative organizations? Um, does uh, anyone of you notice in your city? I hope you, uh, I'm sure you are, but maybe you can share some examples. Maybe one uh, to, to make it uh, easier for you to share. So uh, in Vilnius, uh, in, uh, uh, in the Eastern part, uh, uh, going from center to East, uh, we have uh, in the previous uh, hospital, uh, there is made a technological uh, innovation center, uh, community gathering places, uh, and uh, what is important. So um, uh, this uh, uh, this hub uh, became really a center for uh, for surrounding communities. It is not just uh, like uh, they create and show how smart they are, uh, but uh, regular interactions where community comes and. Uh, uh, have their spaces uh, 
also arises understanding of community, what, uh, what can be done. So from, uh, uh, from interesting thing, their community has um, digitalized uh, garden uh, that uh, they have uh, green small, small green houses that uh, grow uh, salad, uh, but they are supported and supervised uh, digitally. So, and it makes fun because you are in the city, uh, it is park uh, within the city, but local community goes there, not just to walk by themselves or with kids, um, but um, uh, the activity is also shaped by uh, the existing organizations that are created from different points of view. Uh, some of them are technologically uh, creative and innovated. Some of them are really related uh, with arts uh, and they invite community organized joint events from which uh, emerges uh, such things as um, a sustainable gathering for communities where they find uh, uh, joint activities where they can help one uh, another and uh, um, make uh, having uh, sustainable processes in their lifestyle. So that uh, is quite interesting. So. Uh, do you have similar examples in your towns? No, everyone is very, very silent. So I guess it will be homework for your for our next week uh, meeting. <laughs> uh, so you will have to Google uh, out uh, then what is uh, important in your town where there are or there are not uh, uh, such uh, hubs and centers where creative. Uh, industries and uh, communities uh, communities interact so uh, can i speak yeah um i was thinking i guess in my hometown in port uh, we have um porto um innovation hub something like that that's uh, i guess um students citizens and uh, um some people from the government local government they um, they discuss some ideas. Um, so um, I guess that's what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. The ideas yeah. for, for the city uh, to um, to improve the city, actually. And yes. It's yes, that's very important. And uh, this aspect uh, you you mentioned is very important. That uh, previously, while thinking about city developments, we were thinking only about that part. That uh, yes, it should be. Uh, organ um, organizationally uh, planned and made. So yes, really, when we speak about um, about such uh, interactions, usually we may see that uh, uh, they start uh, to include um, uh, to include local communities uh, and not just in formal meetings, but in real interactions on discussing uh, how how they shall develop uh, together with the city. So yeah, it's very very good example, uh, uh, Zhao. Uh, so, um, uh, well, if we, uh, so uh, maybe uh, someone else has have another example, because Jao's example is uh, very great, and I'm sure uh, each, uh, each town uh, um, now have such things, and, uh, and uh, maybe some years uh, ago, I was in one international uh, project where we were looking at different uh, uh, different similar places uh, all over Europe. So it appears that um, uh, there is uh, this trend. So, so I hope that those who didn't find uh, yet uh, from your town find it um, till our uh, next meeting. So, and then uh, the next uh, point, which, um, uh, which is uh, important for, uh, for such uh, comparison uh, is that, um, uh, when we speak um, uh, about creative industries, uh, we see that uh, uh, there are some, um, some aspects uh, and some related fields. Uh, so usually now we notice that there are creative industries and cultural sector. Uh, sometimes they are understood together as an entity, sometimes they are separated. And uh, when we talk about uh, smart, uh, smart communities uh, and uh, creative industries impact on smart communities, we uh, have to have some separations. Uh, 
and uh, also both of them um, uh, share goals. So they uh, create cultural uh, uh, cultural values. Uh, uh, their intent is uh, to bring this cultural uh, and symbolic uh, side to society. Uh, we may see that uh, the uh, the interaction with um, uh, with outside uh, processes are very different. And when we look uh, at creative industries, we may see that uh, uh, usually uh, when they have to implement their um, processes, they have to uh, search for finance and look for fundraising. Yes, sometimes uh, uh, they find money in the end user, but uh, uh, usually we notice that without, uh, without material support and the users uh, uh, do not uh, generate enough, uh, enough of financement of creation, those uh, things. And there is then question about how this uh, 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 particular entity in creative industry, how it interacts uh, with other organizations, uh, how they identify their joint uh, or their common goals, uh, putting different organizations into the same uh, action. Uh, so what uh, what we see that uh, it's um, uh, while talking about creative industry, we find that uh, those organizations uh, have to uh, have to interact uh, uh, on a regular basis with uh, different other surrounding um, uh, surrounding entities, whether they would be formal or not that uh, finding uh, another organizations for implementation and implementation of uh, joint interest uh, going to to different uh, attitude towards public taste because when we speak about uh, creative industries we understand that they have to interact uh, uh, with public tastes even if uh, uh, if they have uh, intent to change them a bit it means interaction on the same level when we speak about cultural se uh, sector, uh, we have um, this uh, slightly uh, different attitude starting from the point that uh, even if uh, they lack financement as well as uh, creative industries, maybe even more usually, uh, usually while creative industries uh, uh, having combination of uh, lots of different um, uh, financement cultural sector, uh, usually have public financement and focus on formation of public taste. Uh, so what does um, allow for us uh, this understanding that we may see that uh, uh, cultural industries are other uh, organizations uh, that um, communicate through different levels and uh, usually they touch this uh, grassroots uh, interests and their activities. And uh, that is important when we will go uh, further to our uh, smart uh, uh, communities, uh, because then we will see that uh, uh, how this uh, interaction is, um, uh, is uh, important in uh, this field. Uh, so as, uh, um, as uh, your studies are uh, in field of architecture, so for us it's, um, uh, very, very important this aspect um, about interaction between uh, city uh, and uh, creative industries. Um, so uh, uh, first, I would like uh, to start that uh, uh, historically in uh, most of the cities, uh, the decisions about uh, how cities should like, what monuments and where are to be built were only only top to bottom uh, decisions. But uh, if we look at uh, uh, contemporary societies and we may have uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, Vilnius examples uh, where municipality um, finds a place which uh, needs to be, uh, uh, needs to be um, uh, revitalized, uh, needs to return to uh, to active uh, life, so it uh, it makes a uh, uh, competition for different parts of creative industries that uh, propose uh, by themselves uh, what uh, shall be done in one place or another, and how their activities will look like. And uh, also in Vilnius, we have uh, uh, 
very regular proposals from um, city municipality uh, about um, about redesigning on different uh, spaces that uh, uh, well that are not included in the heritage of course because if it's included you cannot uh, uh, re you cannot redesign but uh, e each year there are suggestions where um, different uh, different artists and organizations participate uh, uh, propose uh, uh, propose some uh, artistic uh, um, decisions maybe there could be sculptures uh, uh, maybe uh, there could be activity paths and uh, uh, not always it goes only just uh, top to bottom decisions but uh, uh, this those parts that uh, includes uh, this uh, uh, proposals from uh, really active organizations uh, uh, mainly have the biggest influence on uh, on how a city is perceived because it has uh, those both parts uh, that uh, uh, not only uh, externally constructed um, image uh, and brand of the city, but also this image or brand of the city, it interacts um, and uh, uh, has uh, connections with the uh, real understanding about the city from inhabitants. Uh, so what uh, other important aspects uh, that uh, relate um, uh, creative industries and uh, development of uh, cities uh, so that in uh, uh, contemporary society uh, we see very high importance of creative uh, creative class or people uh, that work in creativity so if historically we had in different uh, cities uh, such districts as Montmartre or Soho were inhabited uh, by artists uh, uh, still they rather looked uh, uh, different and uh, even if they were interesting, uh, um, there was a question uh, how much they attract uh, people that are not very interested in arts as themselves. So while in contemporary city, this, um, this changes with, uh, with formation, with the existence of creative, uh, uh, creative class and uh, its, um, its uh, impact uh, on, um, on the district so that uh, if we notice that into particular district that uh, uh, previously was not attractive to uh, moving uh, uh, young creative people, maybe they are from field uh, of design uh, and it uh, includes uh, not only working spaces but uh, especially living spaces as we, as, uh, uh, the district starts to be visible as uh, um, as place where people uh, are walking um, after the work after the work on their leisure time when they gather in cafes. So really, it is seen as very important um, important aspect for uh, for image of uh, a district. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, that is very much related to development of local communities and uh, their creativity. And uh, in Vilnius, uh, um, what the, which way we can see that it's quite supported. Uh, so usually those um, uh, different maker spaces and hubs, if they have uh, some uh, support from city municipality, uh, they have to show us feedback, their interaction with surrounding communities. Maybe they invite uh, uh, kids to visit, visit them. Maybe they organize some joint events with uh, communities. Uh, so, but uh, this uh, input on uh, creativity, which uh, um, is, uh, let's see, we may see two different, uh, uh, two different processes in that. On one hand, uh, it is, uh, uh, shown as important activity uh, through, uh, through support uh, from uh, uh, city administration. On the other hand, it doesn't regulate what kind of creative activities you must uh, do. So it, uh, uh, it leads to really a very, uh, very, very plural and broad understanding about this. And uh, what I uh, wanted um, to show as we are uh, we are going um, uh, maybe um, uh, um, to essential keys of our topic. So what, uh, what does uh, it change when, uh, uh, when we make this uh, 
smart community and uh, put it uh, into a creative sector where there are acting, uh, uh, where there are acting creative industries all together. So for beginning, I just wanted to see this uh, right uh, bottom angle uh, earlier model, which was really very uh, hierarchized, where community was at the bottom part of the city, and uh, usually it uh, didn't uh, had uh, didn't have any impact on decisions and city development or very low. So as we uh, see uh, uh, contemporary understanding of uh, uh, smart uh, communities, um, uh, we may see their interaction and impact to town because uh, uh, even if we wouldn't um, look only at big cities like Vilnius in, uh, in Lithuania, we may see that even uh, smaller cities uh, now are noticing um, uh, importance uh, of, uh, of creative people, of their interaction and the importance of uh, their views about uh, how their town should understand. So as I saw, there are some um, uh, people with Lithuanian names. So uh, to tell uh, example that maybe will not be uh, clear enough from people from um, uh, uh, foreign universities. So we have a quite small town, Anikshi, uh, in, which, uh, in which we see now the same model as we have in Vilnius, but in much, much, much smaller size. So here they are always also communicate uh, um, directly between uh, communities, city organizations, and uh, uh, those, uh, when we look at uh, what is uh, smart community in that field, uh, we wouldn't say that it's just when uh, city administration communicates with community because uh, earlier models were showing that sometimes communities were just uh, focusing on their simple needs uh, like uh, uh, parking, uh, like uh, um, just uh, how to dimin decrease, diminish some noise from traffic. Uh, but when we speak about uh, interaction with, uh, uh, with the smart community, we see that uh, it uh, heads not uh, just to the part uh, what community needs um, from uh, uh, from town, but uh, also sustainability and co-creation. So this uh, we see very much in this um, uh, in uh, uh, in those hubs where also that include uh, um, maker spaces and regular interactions. Uh, then it's what is uh, very important. So uh, together, this uh, creative uh, industries uh, interacting uh, with uh, with local communities. Uh, they make uh, co-creation uh, in innovation. Well, of course, we may see that uh, it is very rare that innovation is technological, very rare because for technological innovation, uh, you need to have a particular, uh, particular education, but uh, those innovations are very visible in, uh, in social field, let's say in interaction between organizations uh, and communities in the join events of, uh, um, of uh, community and um, uh, creative industries that reside in their territory. Uh, also, what uh, what is visible uh, what is visible in most of the cities uh, that have interaction with their own uh, communities that uh, that are operating as a smart level, not just as a gathering of people. Uh, so that uh, usually it goes uh, to discussion level, which uh, discusses not only uh, what can city uh, make uh, better for inhabitants, but also uh, how together community and city can make uh, their city attractive for, uh, for other people that uh, would come and live and create there. So, uh, that um, that are very important and very visible, and um, I would say that it is uh, quite a trend in different uh, Lithuanian municipalities that uh, started to have this um, this discourse with their uh, communities. Uh, what are also very important, and um, I remember your question for previous uh, colleague whether it is uh, possible. Uh, 
some um, uh, some decisions to make smart without uh, electronic uh, uh, path. So well, when we talk about communities, when we say yes, while uh, while we were talking about infrastructure, we we'll say no. So, but when we talk about communities, we say that uh, smart community is not just uh, uh, intelligent uh, community, but uh, it has to uh, operate. Um, uh, operate through levels that not only think that uh, here we are with our needs and the way uh, we are living, but uh, also to try to um, to make uh, impact and to uh, have networking within city, vision, uh, uh, nation, and with uh, businesses. Uh, so uh, what is different when we uh, use words smart uh, on infrastructural uh, aspects and on community aspects so that for community aspects we don't uh, say that it's necessarily needed uh, this uh, uh, electronic uh, technological path but what it's important that this community uh, operates as uh, um, as an entity in uh, a network uh, looking for uh, joint um, joint or shared uh, goals and needs and also what is um, very important, uh, uh, which uh, previously was not, uh, not noticed that much. And uh, uh, historically, when uh, communities started to be important, uh, uh, local governments were just collecting needs from them and uh, on their own deciding uh, what can be implemented, what cannot be implemented, what is uh, uh, important to be implemented, what is not. Uh, however, it was this that uh, community was not um, understood as uh, someone who, who can generate ideas. Um, community was understood like uh, entity having needs. So when we went to smart community, we understand that uh, uh, that if we want to name a particular community smart, we have to see its uh, work in networking, networking with uh, uh, with organizations of uh, their own time type and uh, with different type and with different levels and uh, also have uh, their own decisions for uh, for future developments and uh, ideas how they can implement or at least uh, add their actions to implementations of those things uh so um, this uh, those are uh, the main things uh, so uh, i would like them you or uh, for the next week uh, uh, to look uh, through your towns uh, maybe um, you would remember maybe uh, you would need to google uh, but to find the uh, examples uh, how uh, there is uh, how is going interaction uh, between uh, uh, between uh, uh, organizations from creative industries, uh, do they just um, create and have the, uh, how to say, um, uh, uh, maybe places where they are created and we know that, okay, in this district of Vilnius, uh, we have uh, concentrated uh, cinema firms in uh, this place of Vilnius, we have uh, concentrated architectural firms. Uh, but uh, that is not enough for, for us. It's important to see whether it's just concentration uh, of uh, those businesses, whether those businesses interact with surroundings. And that what is a very important change in contemporary understanding of creative industries that uh, have this very important relation to smart communities that previously, while we were understanding creative industries as creating final product. Now we say that uh, much more important is uh, networking, which is important um, uh, as, um, as a tool to create, um, uh, to create responsible communities, uh, as a tool to create uh, uh, their interest in uh, changing things, uh, in making uh, things better in an interaction. And of course, in uh, educating uh, members uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of community, uh, making them uh, socially responsible and active. Okay, thank you, Victoria, very much. 
Thank you, Skirwanta. It was really, really great to share. So maybe, uh, maybe you have uh, questions. I do have actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, because it was interesting uh, to listen. You know, when you're not so familiar with the creative industries field, you just hear about it, but actually you don't know anything from the insights. So what's the differences? So I have actually two questions: one of money and one uh, maybe. Uh, just direct to the topic of the students. So can we say that uh, creative industries um, that they gather those communities could be the industries of the change makers? Uh, uh, well, um, uh, really uh, the question, uh, it's, um, it's a very, very good question. And uh, when we what is really very different between uh, social world uh, social sciences and um, and material part of infrastructure is that uh, it is uh, quite easy to label material part of infrastructure <laughs> uh, here you have uh, concrete here you have wood but uh, uh, when we go to um, to social part uh, so uh, there is uh, uh, really uh, those things are not uh, uh, that um, uh, classifiable in this way that you can put it only to a one drawer but not into another. Uh, so it was uh, really very interesting because when emerged term uh, of creative industries, uh, it was about a decade of discussion what is uh, relation differences and similarities with, with cultural industries. Uh, and finally, when it uh, seemed that uh, everyone is okay with the notion, everyone understands uh, it uh, more or less similarly and uh, is satisfied, uh, started to emerge new things depending on focus what you are doing. Mm -hmm. Let's say celebrity industries, is it part of creative industries? Yes, it could be just creative industry. But uh, when you notice that uh, a name is created, uh, uh, created uh, a personal name uh, uh, to, um, uh, to create uh, more money, uh, to make ad additional value, it's separate. And sometimes there is question, okay, now we see, we see celebrity industry, is it the same as influencer? See, well, no, influencer, works hard uh, every day to create contents, that means influence. If uh, you have just your name created and this creates additional value where the name participates, it could be uh, celebrity industries. And it was uh, going and developing. Uh, and uh, uh, as you mentioned, this uh, uh, very interesting thing, um, let's say industry of change makers, uh, Recently, uh, I bought a very uh, uh, also um, interesting book, which was called Happiness Industries. <laughs> so okay. I think uh, always we have to make, uh, make a question uh, because if we say that it's um, industry of change makers, we would say that they have to concentrate on change and to make it. But sometimes, uh, there is a, a question whether always, uh, uh, always you are focused towards uh, the change, whether you are focused uh, on uh, uh, catalyzation of community processes, uh, and uh, then it would be difficult to ask a question whether uh, change is the main point. Let's say we can imagine now in Vilnius, um, we have um, uh, some new districts that are uh, quite uh, close uh, to center that are inhabited by quite uh, young people. And uh, those districts start um, to see uh, importance in such thing as uh, having also their local activities, not to be just a place where you return to sleep. Uh, uh, so, and uh, here <laughs> emerges things that you see, do they need to make a change? Uh, not yet. You have to create something. Uh, you have to create this community for people that are fresh there and really want this community. Uh, so that's to say, okay, uh, whether 
the best word for there is a change, whether the best way for uh, word for there is uh, capitalization. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's why I think that uh, uh, if we would speak about this creative industries uh, and their interactions with community, I think for them it would be um, um, difficult to separate with those who concentrate on changes because it means that, uh, uh, but if, of course it can be that you go to uh, all districts that, um, uh, that had become only places where you sleep uh, and that's it, where you don't have uh, common activities, uh, uh, where you don't have uh, uh, local uh, uh, nightlife uh, and so on. Uh, so yeah, it could be, but, uh, but I think that uh, uh, if we talk, um, uh, if we talk about uh, uh, such town as Vilnius, sometimes there are uh, region districts um, quite uh, mixed uh, and uh, uh, well, uh, sometimes uh, between all the houses that are built, uh, some new houses that attract younger people, uh, younger families, and that also the interaction is rather like uh, uh, need for catalyzation than uh, just concentration on change. I think if you have a goal that uh, I want that uh, this place uh, would have uh, uh, their community traditions, so we may have uh, both point of view. In some cases, we need to make changes. Uh, in some cases, uh, uh, in some cases, it would be difficult to attribute word change. It could be attribute uh, um, to create a new network uh, where people just um, freshly alive. In uh, in some places, uh, um, maybe uh, there are more or less uh, just need uh, a space where they could gather so but uh, yeah your question i think it's uh, uh, very fantastic because it uh, uh, illuminates uh, what is um, the biggest difference uh, between uh, material infrastructure and social infrastructure because social infrastructure doesn't easily uh, fall into drawers and uh, uh, it, uh, it's not always easy for them uh, to stay in a small narrow field uh, whether now I'm dealing with uh, uh, celebrity industries, whether fashion industries, uh, if I uh, try to promote uh, particular designs. So yeah, that's right. And what was the second question? <laughs> Or maybe maybe we can give it time for the students to ask, and then if there will be some time, we'll get back to that funny question. Okay, do we have any questions from the audience? Come on, don't be shy. Okay, then, then funny question goes. <laughs> when you were speaking about the celebrities and all the influences, I was just asking the question when you showed the example from the cultural industries that they have to educate. So where does that taped banana vibe, you know, that was so, so, so kind of vibrating through all the networks and social networks going. So where would you put it? Uh, well, I, uh, uh, I would think when we um, uh, have uh, really interaction uh, of uh, a lot of things, uh, uh, of course, we may see that uh, it's, um, uh, it's uh, creative industries in a very broad sense. Um, of course, what is uh, very important and uh, uh, really always when we um, uh, when we speak about creative uh, industries, uh, frequently we uh, forget uh, forget roots of particular symbol that was uh, known to smaller groups. Let's say, uh, uh, I guess, uh, how many uh, how many of us looking uh, at Lady Gaga's meat dress uh, see their Elsa Schiaparelli's uh, dress, uh, which was. Um, as a torn skin through which was visible meat of, on a person. Uh, so also here we may ask a question. Um, yeah, bananas are very interesting <laughs> thing. 
and uh, yeah. when uh, we go to velvet uh, underground uh, uh, then uh, vinyl, vinyl disc with a peelable uh, banana where uh, everyone uh, and the Warhol who was um, uh, who was producing them uh, they were expecting to see something uh, uh, something unexpected there and the uh, unexpected thing was that while peeling the banana you were finding a peeled banana <laughs> that was unexpected <laughs> that was unexpected for us uh, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, when we see uh, when we see uh, uh, some uh, things going uh, as memes or viral in uh, uh, in social networks. Uh, it is um, it is uh, not always easy to say what was um, uh, the main trigger uh, for for broad uh, for broad um, uh, uh, this dissemination of particular aspects. Uh, but uh, but in this uh, field, I rather would say that uh, uh, social networks as a field with all the different activities, social networks as a part of creative industries in a broad sense. And when we speak um, about influence, it means activity. When we speak about uh, celebrity, it means that um, you create your name uh, to earn from another field that's now uh, important um, in the places where you can uh, uh, easily copy uh, digital contents or in the field where you, uh, in field of music, um, where you have to create your own name. Uh, so to gain listeners, you have to at first uh, to show them what are you playing. So you yeah. can't start from uh, earning money from your songs. So you have to make a name uh, which allows you to earn for something else maybe. Um, uh, from other things and then uh, gain the attention. So okay. Christopher is raising yes. his hand. Um, yeah. 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 Oh. You spoke about NFTs. NFTs. That's the non-fungible tokens. And the question I have is that, do you think this is the turning point for people in the creative industry? And also, how do you think this non-fungible to tokens is going to affect, like the smart community? Thank you. Yes, really, a, a really fantastic question. Uh, what is also important in social sciences uh, that uh, uh, we can't uh, predict uh, that uh, very easily how it will make. Uh, uh, make uh, impact, uh, and that is funny that uh, usually people that are dealing with models, uh, how society operates, this is easily to explain backwards, and uh, uh, really it's very, very difficult uh, to predict uh, onwards. Um, but um, now, yes, it is, uh, it is uh, very, uh, very trendy, and people uh, are interested uh, to look at it, but uh, I think that uh, uh, we don't have uh, to thinking about that. Uh, we must not concentrate on its uh, digital part. I think in, uh, uh, in each field, whether we talk about art, whether we talk about design, uh, in fashion, we had some uh, products that uh, uh, became collectibles and uh, the value raised, uh, but the same uh, products from the same collections, they had a decrease of that uh, value. Uh, so we have to, first, we have to understand that not necessarily all, um, uh, all those uh, NF, uh, NFTs uh, will become, uh, become something valuable. Uh, on another hand, uh, where we shall uh, turn that uh, uh, that by now NFTs, uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them are wearable digitally. Let's say that uh, uh, we may have that dress and uh, wear it in some uh, uh, social networks on our avatars, but some of them are not. Some of them uh, just a collectible item as, um, as work of art 
but then we may ask the question uh, how many art collectors there are such because uh, we um, uh, saw a lot of uh, uh, interesting transformations on uh, human uh, history uh, and uh, if we would start let's see this because it's uh, very close to uh, to the point what say what is uh, variable uh, what is valuable and uh, how we keep up its value so we may see that in all times people were exchanging the just the things they needed yes uh, one part of food for another part of food then it went to uh, not real mon money where people were exchanging um, uh, exchanging uh, uh, stones found not in their regions that were substituting uh, well substituting a good word in that case that money did not exist before so they were operating the way later operated really valuable pieces of uh, silver or gold and uh, money then we turned to this money that were just paper and they were agreed on the value then we went to a very symbolic value and uh, if we speak about uh, nfts their value will depend on value which uh, uh, societies will attribute to them. And that what is very interesting in contemporary society that even if we see material hierarchy, uh, the, uh, the impact on value of things, it's not uh, hierarchized at all. And uh, if uh, in the 20th century, uh, we had uh, sayings by famous designers that uh, once it's on the street, it's not fashion anymore. Uh, so uh, in contemporary society, we are saying that uh, uh, before it's out to the streets, you can't say whether it's uh, fashion or whether it's just proposal for tendency. So the same thing we may say for NFT. So what society will attribute, what value that value it will have. And um, well, there is another question whether uh, how society attributes that value, whether it attributes uh, if someone tells it's valuable, whether sometimes it operates on contrary, saying that uh, this is new, I operate as brand seeker and if everyone thinks it's valuable, I don't think it's valuable anymore. So there are uh, lots, of, uh, lots of contradictive uh, things, but it's uh, uh, really, I think uh, we are, we are very lucky to observe this. Uh, if we uh, could observe uh, uh, changes in uh, Bitcoin uh, evolution and uh, uh, how, uh, how it operates. So we have, uh, we may ask the same question whether it will go just to pyramid structure where those who have uh, some NFTs will try to impact on others to want them and to increase value whether it would go just as a collectible in art, uh, whether uh, it will really become a mass product. And uh, uh, when you will be on this seminar next year, I will wear not a material jacket, but an NFT jacket. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your answers, Victoria. And I think we can discussions leave for um, the week on 28th of the March when everyone will be here. So you can d debate a little bit more about Bitcoin. You have to prepare NFTs. your homework. You have to prepare your homework to analyze uh, what uh, are creative industries that operate in your hometown, uh, how they interact with community and uh, local government and uh, how are uh, acting communities and uh, which of them are active and trying to make change. And we will try to identify smart communities. That's your whole work. Okay, thank you very much, Victoria. It's a really pleasure having you and we're looking forward to see you on the, the following events in two weeks. And uh, I think we are running a little bit behind us and Professor Aida is already here. So let's give a five minutes break and then half past, um, we will start with Professor Aida's presentation. Okay. Five minute break.
Okay, thank you. Um, I will just share my screen and... Uh, can you see my screen? Yes? Okay, perfect. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Aida kamishanich Latific. I'm an uh, assistant professor and researcher uh, at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science uh, at the University of Maribor in Slovenia. Uh, so uh, today uh, I, will be, I will give you a lecture on uh, uh, data technologies, uh, advanced data technologies, uh, uh, which I believe that can facilitate modern social responsibility. So we will see at the end what kind of projects we are working on uh, and how those data technologies we can uh, um, uh, use uh, to facilitate uh, um, uh, the, the, this uh, social responsibility. Um, so, um, just, uh, I will uh, uh, at the beginning now just uh, give a short introduction so uh, to the, today's uh, uh, lecture. Uh, so uh, uh, we will uh, be talking about uh, big data uh, characteristics of big data challenges that big data provoke. Um, of course, the big data storage, uh, what kind of uh, um, data technologies we can use uh, to store big data, uh, computing models uh, and architectures uh, for uh, big data. Uh, we will touch also a blockchain technology. Um, and at the end, as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> I will introduce you to some of our projects. Uh, so at the beginning, um, I would just like to um, um, make this short introduction, but even though I'm sure that we are all uh, um, more than aware about uh, of uh, of uh, amount of data that we are collecting and producing uh, uh, every day, um, and uh, uh, those two graphics are actually just demonstrating this uh, in the last year, uh, every minute of a day, uh, what happens. So uh, we can see, for example, ninety seven thousand uh, of hours hours of content consumed on the Netflix or. 350,000 uh, tweets sent and so on and so on. Uh, here we have uh, uh, 500 hours uh, of content uploaded on uh, YouTube and so on. So those numbers are really indicating what's uh, happening. And uh, it's really true that uh, um, data keeps growing and there are no signs of uh, 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 that uh, at some point this will stop or the, the, uh, that uh, the growth will uh, slow. Um, so of course, uh, the last two years, uh, we were part of this uh, um, crazy time uh, with the COVID pandemics uh, and um, which uh, just uh, accelerate uh, uh, the growth of uh, data and, and the capture of uh, uh, and producing more data. So these are the numbers uh, actually just from April of 2020 from the first lockdown, I would say, uh, where uh, you can see that uh, it was increasing online digital activities, uh, basically in an all sense, uh, spending longer using social media or spending more time on mobile apps, spending longer on the messenger services and so on and so on. Um, of course, uh, um, uh, usage of social media. Here we have one graphics where we can see that uh, by age, uh, uh, age group uh, that also increased, uh, even though that the older people uh, didn't maybe use it that much, uh, uh, nevertheless, still we have a, uh, more than 30% of the increase in social media uh, usage. Uh, um, and of course, in all uh, age groups, uh, uh, this happened. So um, basically all of us, uh, we are producing uh, enormous number, uh, enormous amounts of, uh, of data um, and um, uh, it's good to know what should we do with this data. Um, so I would like also to show you uh, this uh, Gartner hype cycle. Um, if you are not familiar uh, with Gartner, uh, it is a, a research and consulting uh, IT company, which is actually keeping uh, track of uh, trends in, in uh, technology, technological trends uh, about the new technologies, and is actually consulting companies 
which uh, uh, which uh, technologies should not be um, forgotten of, uh, which uh, technologies they should keep eye on and uh, try maybe to introduce uh, and use them in, in their uh, business. So I've marked here some of the technologies that definitely today you will hear something about, um, or we will uh, maybe indirectly also talk, talk about those technologies. Maybe just to clarify uh, um, this uh, hype cycle, um, at the beginning we have this innovation trigger when the technology appears and then uh, we come to this point where we talk about the peak of inflated uh, expectations so actually uh, here uh, we um, think uh, um, that some technology is solution uh, for everything uh, which is of course uh, not true and uh, um, um, researchers we love to see uh, the technology in this part when we actually come to the part of disillusionment uh, which means that uh, uh, we understand that some technology is not useful for everything. And we are uh, um, actually coming to the part where we now understand what uh, the technology actual uh, um, usage and what's the, the, the best way to use the, the some technology. Uh, and of course, then we are passing to the plateau of productivity when some technology is actually being uh, uh, used uh, uh, and not just as a, as a piloting uh, projects. Uh, so most of those technologies uh, you would in this year see already in this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this part uh, of the curve. So um, it is important to understand um, what actually big data means of what are the characteristics that uh, describe uh, the big data. So definitely we are talking about the volumes uh, of data, value of data, uh, velocity with which data is being produced. Uh, then we have also uh, variability, variety of data and veracity. So uh, those are the what are called the six Vs of big data. Um, at the beginning, uh, we were talking about three Vs. Uh, now we are talking about six Vs, or you can already find some, uh, some uh, uh, literature where uh, seven Vs are being defined and so on. What is important, uh, when we are talking about big data um, is also that we think uh, um, what we are doing with this data. So uh, how we can capture the data, uh, whether we're sharing those data uh, and with whom, uh, what kind of uh, uh, search uh, over data we will do. Of course, what kind of storage uh, we have and what uh, what's the storage that can actually cope with uh, uh, those amounts of data. Uh, what kind of analysis will be done on data and of course the visualization um, at the end uh, of those uh, analysis uh, performed over um, big data. Um, so um, at, at this moment, at uh, this point, I would like to um, comment a few things uh, uh, as a transition to smart data and transition to fast data. So we were talking first about uh, uh, big data, but uh, um, when we decided to change data from assets, being asset to value, uh, then we came to this transition uh, to smart data. So uh, all the businesses now are actually uh, understand are understanding that uh, it's necessary to use uh, data analysis, predictive modeling, visualization, uh, so that uh, um, their business can grow. They can um, take uh, uh, smart decisions. Uh, um, based on uh, data. So uh, big data analytics allows us to detect hidden patterns and some correlations that otherwise we wouldn't be able to detect. Uh, and of course, uh, the usage of artificial intelligence uh, and uh, um, um, bring this growing uh, focus on smart data um, and not just uh, uh, big, uh, big data. So the smart data is the data in which intelligent algorithms have detected some patterns. Um, and then from smart data, we also can say that we move to fast data. Well, the fast data is the data that is in motion. So um, they are uh, described with velocity. Uh, and we are talking here about streaming analytics. I will mention later on several times uh, the streaming analytics. So it's important that you understand what this uh, uh, and what, what it brings uh, with. So uh, the aim is here to quickly collect and mine structured and unstructured data, uh, and uh, therefore enable uh, activities to be carried out, okay? So it's important for us also to 
um, be able almost in real time then uh, to accept uh, and uh, some uh, um, to take some decisions based on uh, on those uh, uh, data based on those streams and um, fast data often flows in streams into uh, data systems so it is important to fast uh, to perform fast data processing, so uh, to ingest the data, which are millions of events uh, per second, uh, to execute data-driven uh, decision at each uh, event, and of course, uh, uh, to enable uh, automatic real-time decision-making, uh, which will provide insight into uh, the trends uh, behind this uh, data. So what we actually need in this era of uh, big data? Well, uh, the scalability is uh, one uh, big issue here. So whether we need vertical or horizontal scalability, actually um, a vertical, uh, vertical uh, scalability means that we are increasing the capacity of the single environment. And uh, by increasing the amount of data, we actually reach the point where we cannot or has no sense anymore to increase the capacity of singular environment, but we have to go to horizontal scalability. Uh, and that's why here we are talking about horizontal scalability. So actually by scaling and performing horizontal scalability, we actually, our system um, uh, reach um, uh, availability, uh, which is directly related to reliability of a system. Of course, we reach a certain flexibility. And uh, uh, it's important that we, in, with this, with all of this, we increase efficiency and we lead, which lead us to high uh, performance. So um, huge amounts of data uh, uh, actually cannot be stored, processed, and analyzed in the traditional way. Uh, and we are aware uh, of this. So uh, we had to think about uh, the ways how to um, store data uh, and process data, analyze data, analyze those big uh, uh, amounts of data. So um, the traditional way uh, was that we had uh, uh, one processing uh, unit, we would have a one um, storage unit, and normally we would have a structured data. What's a big difference here that we have also semi-structured or unstructured data. So we have different types of data that we have to deal with and the, that we have to find a way how to store them, how to analyze them, process them, analyze them. So um, uh, the problem, first problem is uh, in uh, our processing uh, capacity. So when we are processing some uh, requests, uh, actually the processing in traditional way was done uh, in a sequential way, um, which is actually, which means that some uh, requests uh, are waiting um, while others are being processed. Uh, well, uh, we are not uh, um, willing uh, to wait uh, for this. So that's why we said, okay, we need more processing units. We have to go into parallel processing and not anymore just sequential processing. Perfect. So now we can in parallel process different types of data. But still, our processing units are, they have to access um, storage and they have to send requests to access certain data. Well, we still on the other side have one, one, one storage uh, unit, which uh, will bring us uh, to uh, the network overhead. So what we need now is actually to um, allow to, to find a way how to distribute, use distributed uh, storage. Uh, so in this way, uh, no request uh, will wait, neither, neither for data access, neither for data processing. And this is the key point when we are talking now about uh, um, big data um, uh, architectures and uh, um, processing and analysis. So the traditional way was to have one certain, uh, one cent uh, central storage, now we have this distributed storage. We used to have sequential processing, now we are offering parallel processing. And of course, traditionally, uh, we lack support of uh, unstructured data processing. Now with new solutions, we are actually supporting uh, uh, processing of all types of uh, uh, data. So what we need here are actually uh, architectures and uh, uh, platforms for big data management. 
Uh, we need uh, uh, cloud data storage, uh, NoSQL storage, so all those distributed storages. Um, we need real-time services and storages, so such as in-memory databases, data streaming technologies. Um, and of course, uh, uh, we also can uh, work and, and use uh, the benefits of uh, data ledger technologies, where, of course, we will talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, blockchain technology. Uh, so all those technologies, they can actually, those are data technologies, advanced data technologies, and they can push us further uh, in, uh, in uh, working on different, uh, different uh, projects in, in this uh, big data era. So first, I would like to dedicate some time to explain a little bit about the big data storage. What kind of options do we have? So traditional relational databases, this is a, this is a traditional approach, approach. Actually, they need certain optimizations uh, uh, and uh, uh, adjustments uh, in the, in the um, world of uh, distributed uh, uh, storage uh, systems. Um, NoSQL databases uh, or storages uh, are really important uh, in, in a big data uh, era. Uh, we have uh, four types of uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, uh, they are key value, document databases, then we have a, a column family or a white column um, databases and graph databases. Each one of them are actually addressing a certain a uh, certain issue and is uh, offering a solution to a certain uh, problem. And of course, um, big advance in uh, uh, cloud uh, storage systems. So I will start with, uh, with the cloud storage. So um, uh, those are data storage services that are built and accessed via cloud, uh, so through uh, cloud platforms. I'm sure that you are familiar with those. Of course, uh, um, they offer um, relational databases uh, and NoSQL databases. Uh, uh, support um, and they are bringing us this flexibility that we need uh, and they are offering traditional features of a traditional storage but they add flexibility of cloud computing so that we can actually scale uh, our storage at the moment uh, when we need it. Um, we don't have to uh, buy dedicated hardware. Um, those storages can be managed by users themselves, or they can be uh, managed by um, and provided by the vendor of uh, a service, by the provider of a service. And uh, I'm sure that uh, those examples you already know. So uh, services that are available uh, through the uh, Microsoft Azure platform or Amazon um, uh, web services or Google Cloud uh, platform and so on. Uh, so what are the pros and cons? So definitely some of them I've already mentioned. So definitely it's the easier access uh, for users. Um, scalability, so this cloud elasticity. Uh, recovery, uh, so data is protected by backups on remote servers. Uh, the hardware independence, so the cloud service provider is dealing and taking care of uh, the infrastructure and not the user. Uh, and of course the security, the respons responsibility uh, um, for security is uh, taken um, uh, by a service uh, provider. Um, Disadvantage, disadvantages, well, there are some of them, so the limited control over the database or there is no control over sensitive data, uh, and also some of the disadvantages can uh, be also uh, uh, in uh, costs of uh, uh, payment for, for services. Um, I've mentioned NoSQL databases. Uh, um, we said on one side relational databases or different analytical databases, and on the other side NoSQL databases, which offers actually good support, uh, amazing support for uh, all types of data, uh, also for unstructured uh, data, while relational databases are actually just supporting um, structural uh, data. Uh, so uh, they are offering us a possibility of, uh, of storing uh, huge volumes of data. Uh, they are suitable for distributed storage and data uh, processing. Actually, they were built uh, with this in, in, in mind. Um, and they have flexible schema, so which is important when uh, designing a database um, model. 
Um, some cons, well, of course, they can be a lack of standardization. There are newer solutions then uh, compared to relational uh, databases. Uh, possibly um, there can be less function functionality and support for specific solutions. And uh, uh, also it's a less emphasis uh, on data consistency. Of course, these things uh, change uh, over time and there are different solutions. Uh, uh, those <clears throat> characteristics actually uh, depend on a uh, uh, specific solution. Uh, so there are solutions also offering uh, the strong consistency over the, the eventual consistency that was uh, uh, the primary and first goal of uh, NoSQL databases. Uh, then a few words about the data warehouses. Data warehouses are storages that are optimized for analyzing relational data, uh, which are coming from transactional systems. Uh, um, and uh, we can have a different, uh, different data sources, uh, which we have to uh, take uh, data from. Uh, so extract the data, uh, then refine those data, enrich them, so make transformations, and then load data in um, a data structure and schema which is predefined. Uh, so in advance, we already know what kind of schema we want and uh, uh, where we are, where we will uh, load our data. So this is the ETL process that is done here uh, by extracting, transforming data, and loading data to uh, data warehouses. And of course, then those data they can play the role of a single source of truth uh, for our company, which can be then used for reporting different analytics and as a starting point for data mining uh, algorithms. Uh, so definitely it's important to integrate data uh, across the whole organization. So data need to be aggregated uh, so that the conclusions would be relevant uh, to the organizations. Um, another Technology and other um, data storage uh, are data lakes. Um, so those are highly scalable storages. So um, they allow uh, large amounts of data to raw data to be stored in their native uh, uh, form. Uh, so um, they, um, one of the advantages is that normally they could, it could be also low implementation costs uh, because we can use a different uh, uh, open source solutions. Uh, um, uh, scalability is definitely something that is an uh, uh, advantage of uh, data lakes. Um, and that definitely the fast access uh, they offer us to data without traditional data modeling. Well, disadvantages uh, are then the complexity, which is then moved towards the analysis. So um, in uh, data warehouses, we had to um, uh, first make transformation, capture data, save data in certain form that our um, analysis would be fast. Uh, here, uh, we are doing fast capturing of data. We are taking data, we are leaving them in a row for, uh, as in a natural form, but at the point when we have to analyze those data, then uh, this part is uh, quite demanding and it brings a lot of additional complexity. So here also we come to the point that we have to continuously monitor data, uh, data quality, uh, and there are different solutions that are coming out uh, uh, as a solutions to some of those uh, disadvantages, some of those uh, cons uh, um, um, of, of a data lakes. So those are the data reservoirs. They are addressing those uh, issues as a complexity uh, in this part of uh, analytics, data quality and security risks. Uh, risks. Um, uh, because we have all data in one place. So here we have to define how to govern uh, big data. So our data has value, we are aware of this, therefore it needs protection. So um, uh, also data quality can change. So we have to understand um, what's their origin, what uh, for what purpose uh, they were processed and to understand whether they are to be able to understand whether they are suitable uh, for uh, use. 
And of course, data has a lifespan. So it needs to be removed when it's no longer uh, has uh, value. Uh, so in uh, data lakes, we keep data, data is there, uh, even though that maybe uh, data is not uh, valuable anymore. So this is uh, then uh, next step um, uh, so that we would remove data which are not useful anymore. So I have already mentioned partially this, this what's on this slide, slide. So uh, those uh, paradigms of reading data. So we have so-called schema on write and schema on read. So the schema uh, on write, it means that it has to be defined before storing the data, so in advance. And it's typical for relational databases. I already mentioned typical for uh, data warehouses. So we here we need extra effort in ETL uh, process uh, uh, data transformation. Um, it's suitable for structured data. It's less flexible. Uh, it offers us fast query results on the other side, uh, but we need more time to load the data. So to pre prepare data uh, to be um, saved in those kind of uh, storages. On the other side, uh, this is a schema uh, on read. Uh, so uh, here, a schema is created only when reading data, not when storing it. So uh, we don't have to define schema in advance. Um, so it is adding additional flexibility uh, um, in, in, this, in this sense. It's suitable for unstructured data, it's more flexible, uh, but it requires more time for queries. So it's faster in loading data, but it's uh, requiring more time for analysis, for uh, uh, preparing a query. Uh, now I would like to uh, mention some of the computational models and architectures for big data. So it's uh, important also to understand um, uh, those two uh, models, batch processing and stream processing. Uh, so batch processing, it means that we are processing uh, large amounts of data which are received by the system in a given time period at once. So we are, got, we are receiving a, a, a certain amount of data. We know what kind of amount of data uh, we will receive, uh, it's more time consuming and results will, will be available when the, this transaction is completed. Um, stream processing on the other side is uh, um, meant uh, for processing of continuous data streams almost we can say in real uh, real time so the re uh, results are of course then available um, as almost as fast as uh, uh, the data are entering in the system uh, the amount of data that we have to process is not predetermined um, and of course the um, results are immediately available after uh, processing uh, this is a one of the, uh, the possibilities to present, represent the big data architecture, just in brief. So we have different types of data sources collecting different types of data, structured, unstructured, semi-structured data. Of course, we have to have a layer where we will ingest this data collector layer. Um, down here, horizontally, we have a data monitoring layer and security layer, which is important in all single aspect of, uh, in all single phase uh, of, um, uh, also in different uh, uh, layers. And of course, when we collect uh, data, we have to save them. We can have different types of uh, distributed storages. Then we have this data processing layer, where we can have batch processing, real-time processing, so the stream, uh, streaming uh, processing, and of course we can have a hybrid processing. Then of course we have a data querying layer uh, to get some insights into the data, and of course analytics uh, engines where we can already include different analytics from statistical to using machine learning and all these uh, um, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, for predictive modeling and so on. And at the end, we have this uh, visualization layer where we want to represent um, the insights that we, uh, that we got uh, uh, by the analysis. 
so uh, we have, in the case of uh, big data, we have a, a different architectural uh, patterns uh, uh, here. Uh, so, for example, uh, lambda architecture pattern. Uh, this is the 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 way how this uh, pattern is uh, established. So we have a uh, um, basic processing uh, layers where we have a batch layer for. A, Pre-processing of all data. We have a, a streaming um, uh, layer, uh, so we also call it speed uh, real-time uh, layer uh, for uh, um, uh, processing of streams. Uh, and we have a, a serving layer, which uh, serves the final processing uh, results of the other two uh, layers. Uh, on the other side, Kappa architecture is actually having only these two layers, no batch uh, layer, but only streaming layer as a real-time uh, layer and then serving, uh, serving layer. Uh, this is a pattern for data lake. Um, so we can have raw data from di different sources uh, um, and all these data are ingested uh, in, in one uh, location, so uh, stored in, in one location. Uh, and then this data is uh, um, um, uh, used, uh, whether we have to perform batch processing, whether we perform uh, real-time processing, uh, the results of uh, processing uh, um, are then, of course, uh, saved in the uh, data store. And then this uh, data can be used uh, for different uh, analytics, analysis, whether it's a uh, business intelligence or whether we are using it for uh, um, uh, as an entry point for some uh, um, uh, machine learning uh, um, um, methods, uh, algorithms, and so on. Um, so now uh, I would like also to um, uh, give you a few words on the blockchain technology. I'm sure that um, you are uh, you have heard a lot about blockchain. Maybe you have already studied some something on on this topic. But just uh, to maybe repeat, and for those who are not uh, familiar with it, uh, to give a, a basic information about the blockchain technology. So um, we are talking here about the peer-to-peer. So it's a distributed and decentralized network as a basis. Then another uh, fundamental thing in in a blockchain technology that we are using. This is a type of distributed and um, replicated uh, database. Uh, data storage is uh, um, in the form of a digitally signed transactions. So we here have a different type of data storage where we signed each transaction. So it has additional security level here. Uh, then storing uh, transactions uh, in uh, is in the form of a chronological ledger. So the ledger is implemented in the form of interconnected uh, blocks, where each block is then uh, referencing uh, the, the previous block. Um, that's why we uh, can consider uh, and we can talk about blockchain technology as uh, uh, the one that is uh, providing us immutability uh, characteristics. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we can have different stakeholders uh, uh, in the same network uh, and we will have to maintain one truth, so one chain. Uh, and how we do it using uh, consensus algorithms. There are different types of distributed consensus algorithms, but uh, um, um, here um, probably you have heard that, um, uh, a lot of uh, people speaking about Bitcoin mining, mining uh, miners that exist. Uh, actually mining is a symbolic name for the distributed consensus algorithm called proof of work. But there are a lot of different others, uh, other um, consensus algorithms that are used uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, blockchain uh, um, applications. So um, when we talk about blockchain, there are certain characteristics that our environment has to fulfill. So definitely we have to be operating in distributed environment. We have to have a lack of trust between different st stakeholders. Um, we have to share control over data. Here we have to be careful. We are not talking about sharing data. We know how to share data. The problem here is to share control over data. This is a big difference uh, at this point. And, uh, if we want to remove intermediaries uh, and we want to have a business directly with our stakeholders, um, then if we are completing all these, um, let's say, uh, um, characteristics, then uh, it's good 
moment to think about using a blockchain technology. So blockchain can offer us a traceability, immutability, consensus uh, between stakeholders. Of course, blockchain technology can have different types of, uh, uh, we can use it for, for different uh, uh, use cases, you know, different cases, um, definitely as a payment mechanism, we have seen it uh, functions well, also as a digital asset uh, creation, uh, and definitely as a distributed ledger. This, uh, this is something that we are using it a lot uh, in, a, in uh, proper real business uh, uh, domains. So now uh, I would like to introduce you a few um, uh, projects that we are working on um, that we have started maybe several years ago, some of them starting uh, in this year. Uh, and just to show you how we are incorporating all these technologies uh, into real world uh, projects. So the first one is the Edu, Edu CTX uh, platform, uh, which is based on a blockchain technology. This is a platform that we developed uh, uh, and in uh, uh, 2019 received the uh, uh, E award, which was, uh, um, which is given by a um, Slovenian um, informatics society informatics uh, as a, an award for the best project in computer science. Uh, so our platform is uh, um, uh, meant for managing, assigning, and presenting digital certificates for any kind of formal or informal education. So uh, our stakeholders are normally individuals who are receiving some education, some educational institutions yes, that are giving some education. And of course, we can have different other stakeholders uh, as organizations are uh, that offer uh, some uh, education. Um, we have also published a uh, uh, European patent, uh, uh, which is uh, um, uh, part uh, um, of this, uh, this uh, uh, platform. So we have used here a um, uh, consortium type of blockchain. Uh, we've used the Ethereum uh, platform. Uh, we have used the uh, consensus mechanism proof of authority. Before I mentioned that uh, proof of work, uh, here we, we are using proof of authority. Um, what's important that uh, those micro credentials are issued by educational institution. So actually, uh, they, those are the blockchain transactions. Um, and here are, we are talking about non fungible uh, tokens, of course. Uh, so uh, for those who are not familiar, what are not fun, uh, non fungible tokens? Well, those are the uh, tokens that are received, but you cannot um, you cannot send them uh, to anyone. Those are just uh, given to you. Um, uh, in the case of uh, fungible tokens, of course, when we talk about uh, um, working, uh, uh, for example, Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency, of course, those are the tokens then that can be um, transferred. Uh, in our case, of course, uh, uh, when we are talking about micro certificates, micro credentials, uh, well. Uh, uh, we cannot transfer them and we cannot send uh, them to someone else in the sense that that person could uh, then use them uh, as their own. Um, so uh, another uh, project that we uh, were working on was uh, uh, actually complementing blockchain technology and artificial intelligence. So to make a platform for global employability. Um, so to try to solve some employability issues uh, and to offer equal opportunities for job seekers. So here we are doing an automated recruitment process. So we have a process of uh, uh, matchmaking um, for a, a certain project, ideal finding ideal uh, um, a person to work on. Um, and of course, uh, um, uh, this, this project matching, this uh, job searching is done automatically. Uh, and of course, uh, blockchain technology is there to, um, to guarantee uh, the immutability of data, data integrity, uh, and the smaller, of course, fees for uh, payments. Um, another aspect that we are working on are, um, is, uh, is in uh, healthcare. Uh, so here we are using, using machine learning uh, um, algorithms to optimize uh, um, treatment procedures. Uh, uh, so um, definitely um, to support clinical decision uh, making processes. Uh, so for example, we can prognose a disease progression or find causes uh, of a disease progression or predict maybe 
appearances of uh, new diseases, so comorbidities of occurrence, uh, or to identify most effective treatment procedures, so which drug uh, is shown to be uh, the most effective or drug uh, that should be prescribed for individual, uh, individual treatment. Um, and at the end, I would like to mention you two projects uh, that we are also working on them. Um, and uh, the first one is uh, uh, Greenpoint. Uh, so it's also based on uh, a blockchain technology. So here we allow uh, for uh, food traceability. Um, our Greenpoint is actually uh, supplying public institutions, schools, kindergartens, um, restaurants, uh, the companies with the fresh vegetables, uh, um, fruits, uh, and other projects. And the uh, final consumer can uh, check at uh, each time, at each point, moment, what uh, what was actually happening with some of those vegetables or those products, um, and can trust this information because this information was. Uh, saved, uh, um, stored in the blockchain, uh, and it uh, uh, was not, uh, um, um, what could not be uh, changed. So, uh, uh, so in order to allow actually the shortest food supply chain, so from farmer uh, to the local uh, market, uh, local, uh, uh, local store, uh, it's the, the shortest pos possible time so that I can be sure that taking uh, some tomato in that uh, um, store, uh, I can check uh, uh, and reassure that uh, really this tomato was uh, uh, the one that was uh, grown in um, um, uh, 20 kilometers uh, far uh, farm. So this is uh, one of our real world uh, um, projects. And another one that is directly related also to that one is the one project, European project uh, that we are uh, at the moment uh, working on that we have just started in, uh, in uh, uh, January. Um, and it's a four year project that we will try uh, our best to um, actually um, implement data driven solution for data collection on food loss and waste. Uh, unfortunately, mm, we still talk about food being wasted uh, and it's a third of uh, food produced is actually each year wasted. Um, and uh, the goal of this project is actually to uh, make the progress in this sense that we can lower um, the, the food loss and waste so uh, uh, tr to try to support the, this transition of current food systems so that they can reduce uh, food loss and waste. So we would allow the transparency, monitoring, management of, uh, of data, of course, ensure secure data flows between food production supply and the consumers, uh, and uh, um, actually try to, to, to do our best to, to change um, to change the, this food supply uh, world. Um, so um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that I was not uh, too, um, uh, too, too, uh, <laughs> too, too long uh, in this presentation. Um, so uh, if uh, there are any uh, questions, I would be glad to answer them. Yeah, it was um, thank you, Aida. That was really, really amazing presentation, and we already have the Jao, uh, who is interested in asking you something. Sure. Um, my question is: I don't think I understood well the difference between structured data and unstructured. So uh, oh, okay, so uh, yeah, structured data. I, I'm not sure how you are familiar, but the, in a general, structured data they follow some predefined structure. So you can say, for example, uh, typical relational databases are saving structural data. So um, uh, you would have, for example, data about uh, uh, some person uh, and it would follow the certain structure so that uh, there you would introduce the name of the person, the surname of the person, data, date of birth, uh, tax uh, number, and so on and so on, the address and so on. So we have a predefined structure where we can introduce those data. Then when we talk about the unstructured data, uh, we uh, actually don't have any predefined structure. So data can be of any form, any kind. 
So semi-structure are, for example, emails, where we can say, okay, who is the sender, who is the receiver, so those are the structured parts, but then we have a text which can contain whatever, right? So um, those are unstructured data, but still those data, they, they, are, they contain certain information that is important for us, that is important for us and that we can extract some knowledge from those data. And of course, uh, um, unstructured data are video materials, uh, audio materials, and so on. So uh, those data, uh, actually, they, as said, uh, they are important. There are a lot of, uh, of those data, um, and we would like to extract the, the knowledge from this data, but we have to deal with these data in different ways that we did in traditional way. Okay, so when with the structured data, we can do a little bit different thing than um, unstructured data. And that's why we need also different, uh, uh, different approaches, different ways of uh, storing data, different ways of processing data, and so on. Okay, I understood. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Okay, I have them. <laughs> I have two questions. Um, the first would be about the um, digital employability. That's like really interesting app because we have like the very uh, basic ones when you have like the, the database and the, then the employers just kind of apply looking for, for, for the different candidates. So my question was, what is the proof of actually the experience that they provide with that data? Is there any verification? Yeah, because for each, actually here is the verification, everything that is uh, uh, saved, stored in a blockchain. So actually the first time that you do the job uh, for someone, so when you match make, ah, you know, okay. um, if the uh, person who has offered you a job is satisfied with you, uh, it will be you know, tagged, you know, that you have done the good job, it is marked and everything. So based on this, uh, you, other people can follow your experiences. Of course, there are different moments where maybe someone can, not, can be um, unsatisfied with your work, but you have done good job, you know, so there are also the, then in that case, uh, uh, some um, um, uh, how to say, uh, like uh, tribunals, which would then evaluate uh, so that you won't lose your uh, good points uh, because of someone else's error or something like this. You know? So it's like very much like scoring system in China where they have for each individual uh, resident with a different like avatars and profiles. So it's very good platform for the young professionals starting their career to have recorded, but not like the old us. <laughs> to have the data that cannot be probably proved. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so that you can actually um, make the progress in, and of course, work from anywhere in the world. Um, anyone can access this uh, information, public information that is uh, saved on public ledger, you know. Okay. And the second question was about um, the food waste. And I know that the, in European Union, that there is a certain amount or limitation for each country for different products that they can export or provide for the European Union countries. And uh, there were cases uh, in Spain, in, 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 in Greece, Italy, that there was a lot of um, good years of the citrus fruits and they were just wasted because they couldn't export them to anywhere. So is this uh, app as well dealing with the uh, EU legislations that are kind of restricting us, but at the same time trying to help uh, the farmers somehow to accommodate those capacities that they don't waste. It should be actually in the, in the both directions, in several directions. So from from the um, addressing different uh, um, um, policies uh, um, in EU policies uh, towards also at the moment, what can we do? How we can accommodate those capacities that we have, you know, so that you would have basically a real time uh, platform where you can uh, uh, access data and see what's happening at the moment. So that, for example, a farmer who needs uh, um, food for the maybe uh, for his uh, animals you know that can see that there will be wasted food in some kindergarten this amount of food and that can go and reach for this food instead of finishing 
taking that this food would uh, finish in in uh, in uh, waste yeah in mean, a bin uh take it for this second step then another thing is that uh, we are, we are all aware that uh, um expiration dates uh, are what they are but uh, a lot of times uh, the food is good enough even after the expiration date so this food then can be taken uh, in specialized stores where you are aware of that you are buying something lower cost but uh, um, that has expired the, the um, uh, that has expired the date um, but of course uh, here are a lot of uh, policies and different uh, governmental yeah. influences that we have to um, <laughs> match so that everything can then fit together Okay. Okay. Thank you, Aida. Uh, it was really interesting presentations and the students were asking as well for your contacts. So maybe I can send them so they could keep in contact with you. Sure. Okay. Thank Sorry. you very much. Uh, yes. Sky, uh, can I just um, say another thing? Um, I would I would very like to have this, the access. I don't know if either you are going to uh, leave us the PowerPoint because for me, I'm not uh, like... Um, I don't know about that area, but I found it fascinating. So if you could send the PowerPoint, it would be great. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I will share them with the students if it's Thank okay. You. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Have a good day. And we have already a Gideus. Hello, Gideus. Uh, we had. Uh, yes. Hello. Hello. We had several sessions. Is it okay for a five minute break? Uh, so everyone could get refreshments and then just stretch their legs. Is that okay with you? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. So five minute break and we will come back in 25 past um, 12. Thank you.
Okay, so welcome back. And today we have in in the afternoon session um, Egidius Krodanis. Um, Egidius has a really great experience uh, starting from road engineering and uh, doing the uh, candidate PhD uh, studies in our technical university. So maybe a couple of words about you, Egidius. I'll hand it in to you. Hello. Uh, today is uh, today. I am celebrating because I am online with uh, the Faculty of Ar Architecture, and physically I am sitting in the Vilnius Tech uh, Faculty of Electronic. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, yes, it was uh, it was very nice because you know I look I am I am sitting in the classroom with a lot of uh, smart devices. Yes. Uh, yeah, for for more than 12 years yes i, I was working at uh, civil engineering uh, faculty at Vilnius tech and uh, i was uh, giving lectures about uh, urban planning and mobility uh, uh, talking about the professional career i was working at lithuanian road administration and was uh, working as a ceo of lithuanian road administration and uh, from 2017, I left uh, the public sector and moved to the private sector to the consultancy and worked uh, with uh, very various projects uh, across the globe and uh, in Lithuania, in Kazakhstan, in uh, Kyrgyzstan, in Serbia, everywhere. And uh, now I am running uh, two companies. Uh, one is, uh, one is uh, located in Lithuania and we are developing a smart mobility platform for public transport. Uh, 15 people is working, uh, are working on it and uh, we are trying to harvest energy from the uh, human body heat. And uh, two people are working on this uh, project and uh, uh, sometimes I am doing a, a transport consultancy projects in my Austrian company. That is uh, a bit, uh, introduction about me and uh, maybe I will move to my presentation. Of course, of course. Okay. I will try to share my screen. Okay. Can I see myself? The present. Oh, can you see my uh, screen? Yes, the whole PowerPoint. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay, for today I prepared uh, the presentation about uh, the concept of a smart city and once uh, Monte invited uh, to, to, to give a lecture, I was thinking about uh, what I can present and decided that uh, maybe I will present the real case uh, on which I was working, uh, was preparing uh, the concept of smart speed, uh, city. Uh, I will show later on, and uh, the city is Shule, and uh, and uh, they started already to implement all of what was done uh, during the concept uh, preparation and after approving. Uh, yes, uh, what is the, the smart city? Mm, uh, we had a lot of uh, discussions. Uh, what is the smart city? What is the difference between the city? what we had before and what is the smart city. And uh, we found, uh, uh, and we were doing a lot of uh, surveys and uh, asked uh, the people uh, how they feel. Uh, we asked the politicians and we found that uh, participants of the smart city interact and cooperate uh, with each other. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, three parts of the uh, participants of the smart city we selected uh, the first is the population of society, and uh, it mainly uh, uh, works with municipality and with the business. And uh, 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 looking at this uh, structure of these uh, participants, we found that uh, if they collaborate between each other in different ways, uh, then uh, the more comfortable and uh, uh, more easy life is in the cities or the places uh, where we live. If uh, uh, municipality do the 
uh, very fast and right decisions and the business generates uh, money, then the pop population or people are very happy. Uh, when we tried uh, to understand uh, how the people uh, understand the smart city and when we talk about the smart city, uh, we reviewed a lot of scientific literature and uh, we asked uh, the people when we say the smart city, uh, with uh, what uh, the smart city associate, associates uh, for them. And we made this uh, cloud of words. And first of all, you can see that most of the uh, people said that uh, when we say about the, when we ask about the smart city, they say it is infrastructure, then it is sustainability, uh, human communication and community, economic, social capital, and uh, technologies. That is uh, what the people uh, feel or, or, or understand what is the smart uh, city. And uh, another thing is uh, that uh, a lot of people and uh, the technical literature writes that uh, smart city is an uh, evolving system of devices, sensors, and communications and data to ensure the well being uh, to the community. And, uh, we found that the city uses smart devices, sensors, network, and communication technologies, and the different uh, data collection systems. Then this data is consolidated and integrated into a common city data system. Then citizens, business, and the public sector uh, can access this data, and uh, the, this data they can uh, provide uh, faster services or uh, create new products, and then. Uh, these results are returned to the real life of the city of the citizens, and that uh, meets the needs of uh, the communities in the cities. Uh, uh, when we uh, uh, when we talk about in what uh, spheres the smart city must work, we uh, again we had a lot of discussions. And we found that uh, these uh, columns could be a smart government, smart life, smart population, smart environment, smart transport, and smart economics. And if we can find uh, the possibility to join all of these columns, then we can have, and we can see that we have a smart city. Uh, doing the analysis, uh, uh, we, we found that uh, some of the cities is uh, just deciding that uh, they will not cover all these uh, uh, pillows, uh, but uh, they will work, for example, only in smart governments so or only they develop smart uh, transport. And some of the cities, uh, they say that uh, we will develop everything and, uh, 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 and we will invest uh, to all of these uh, smart uh, things. And uh, if we, if we say that we are uh, now converting the existing cities to the smart cities, uh, the first question is, uh, and what we had from the, um, from the citizens, what are benefits uh, for me? What are the benefits uh, for citizens? And uh, first of all, it is improved quality of life. It is improved uh, services quality, uh, new services developed and the prestige of the city is improved. Uh, there is a lot of uh, good examples of uh, smart cities and uh, what uh, different cities uh, had achieved or different cities worked in uh, very different spheres to achieve this uh, smartness of the cities. And uh, uh, Singapore has chosen to be uh, the smart nation, not uh, the city, and they decided that uh, they will uh, work in the health sector and uh, the health sector uh, services will be very uh, effective. A lot of digital technologies will be used then in education. For um, education, they say that uh, we, they are collaborating between students, teachers, and parents, and uh, they are learning how to utilize a digital infrastructure. They are doing uh, uh, automotive uh, repetitive of the teacher's work and etc. 
for the transport, uh, they are implementing a lot of intelligent transport uh, systems uh, and uh, in implementing solutions for the uh, public transport. Very important is what they are doing. They are implementing a lot of solutions for the homes uh, to, to have at every private home uh, so sensors and intelligent systems that will that improves the efficiency and reduces uh, the emissions of the um, energy wasting. And uh, 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 in finances, uh, they, they have uh, and developed smart regional and global financial center. And uh, um, they are working in very different FinTech and uh, real-time economy solutions. Very near Lithuania is Latvia. It is our neighbor country, and they have the real smart uh, city, uh, which is uh, in Yelgava city. I was uh, there for several times and uh, had uh, some excursions uh, with uh, public uh, sector people to, to show how the city from the very common city yeah, during seven years can become a smart city and what systems and what devices and sensors can be used and how the uh, harvested data can be exchanged to come back with uh, new services. Mostly in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Yelgava, uh, they have uh, mm, uh, working with uh, smart uh, transportation. They are measuring water level. They are uh, uh, checking uh, street lightning. Uh, they are inviting uh, people suggestions or compliance uh, automatically. And a lot of, of uh, different uh, services they are providing. The last, what I saw when I was visiting uh, Yelgava, I think it was a year ago, they were developing the system uh, for the schools where uh, special cameras was analyzing every class and checking other, all the pupils in the classes. And if they see that there is a gap in the class, they automatically inform parents and uh, uh, management of uh, the school that uh, children are not in the school this day. I need to, uh, to, to come back and check what are the results, but uh, in that uh, way, they were, they were working with uh, uh, with uh, education. Uh, Helsinki, uh, they have a smart city concept and uh, uh, areas in which uh, they are working, it is uh, city cleanliness, uh, they have the special uh, devices, uh, they are using principles of circular economy. In health se sector, they are digitalizing all the processes uh, in healthcare and uh, trying to develop a very good self-care and disease prevention uh, systems. Uh, digital industry, they are working uh, with log logistic optimization. Uh, they um, try to use uh, the robots uh, for the production and internet of things allows uh, different devices to share the data. Uh, citizens, uh, 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 for the citizens, they, they, they developed open urban development. Uh, uh, citizens shipment is active in all the processes participation. And uh, a lot of public services are developed to be very fast and very transparent and very uh, effective. Uh, for the mobility, uh, they are trying to, uh, to, to test uh, autonomous uh, uh, mob uh, mobility solutions, smart uh, logistics and uh, integrating a lot of platforms to the uh, everyday uh, mobility or uh, travel planning. Uh, Inhomen is, uh, has a vision to become the city of the smart society and they work uh, for the public interest, the, for the local economy and in, in, uh, in uh, implementing various uh, uh, solutions, uh, systematic decision-making and adaptation uh, to the changes. When we talk about uh, the uh, smart mobility, uh, uh, we need to check uh, 
what is uh, the smart mobility and how it changes and what encourages uh, to, the, to these uh, changes. And we see that uh, uh, post-war recovery has turned the car into a household item and a way of life. And uh, from the uh, 50s, we have this very fast growth of uh, uh, cars. Then uh, mm, the global oil and fiscal crisis uh, changed our mobility to, 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 to uh, mobility using uh, public transport and bicycle. And in 2008, the financial crisis has paved the way for the new and very smart platforms such as Uber, Waze, uh, Traffic, and uh, Tessera. And from 2008, we can say that uh, this uh, smart uh, and different uh, way of uh, mobility started uh, to grow. And uh, this uh, 2020 pandemic could be the basement for another one regeneration of the smart mobility. And this uh, smart uh, mobility and smart uh, mobility uh, solutions are very important. And European Commission uh, is seeing that, uh, that uh, management of mobility, what was uh, before just uh, uh, just cannot cover the uh, and reduce the accidents, uh, reduce the losses of productivity, the air pollution is increasing. And if uh, there will not be any actions, uh, then uh, uh, the situation will get uh, worse and worse. Uh, uh, when we check uh, uh, what is the mobility, and what could be the uh, smart mobility? First of all, we see that we need to work in policy making, in uh, uh, sustainability and energy use. And uh, here you can see in this picture a lot of uh, parts in which uh, uh, improvements must be done. One of the smartest things that uh, is, uh, during the next 10 years, uh, we, we shall understand and we shall move from the system, which was uh, focusing to the car, or it is named car-centric, to people-centric. It means that uh, our daily trips, we can do in different ways, uh, using different uh, systems, even not using any transportation forms. For example, if we want to meet now, we don't need uh, to go in the physical place. We can use uh, Zoom or other solutions. For that reason, we need to think about the people and the system and the approach will be uh, people-centric. It means that uh, people has uh, the uh, needs and uh, we as a professionals, we need to, to check uh, how we can help them. For example, we can use multimodal systems, we can uh, uh, use a shared system and that could be uh, more safer and uh, less uh, polluting. Uh, different, uh, different companies and different cities are implementing different uh, systems for the mobility, smart mobility management. Here is uh, a platform uh, which was developed by company Stvarko and it can uh, join very different needs of the mobility, for example, road mapping, parking, uh, traffic lights uh, management, uh, and uh, uh, public transport planning, and uh, et cetera. And if we can use for one city, one platform, and collect from different modes of the transportation data and join this, we can have a very smart and very efficient uh, mobility. Another one approach uh, was uh, uh, what uh, is ongoing and what is very new that we need to understand that uh, this uh, 2020s, 2030s will be the totally biggest change in the smart or even in the mobility during the last uh, 50 years. Because now we are testing the autonomous mobility, mobility, shared mobility. And what was uh, before, I think in 10 years, uh, we will not use uh, this, uh, our common uh, transportation modes. Uh, another mm, important platforms are 
for the logistic is, I, I think that uh, you know already from 2024, uh, there will be EFTI uh, platform uh, necessary in Europe and all the logistic and all the documentation uh, cross logistic will be transformed to digital. And uh, these systems, what you can see in the slides, uh, the national access points for the providers and data exchange will be implemented and we will see the more effective planning and uh, organizing of the logistics. Uh, coming back to the smart city, uh, yes, uh, first of all, if we want to implement the smart city, we need to understand where the city is uh, standing at the moment, then we need to do a decisions uh, what we want to implement, what budget we have, and uh, what we need and what we want to achieve. For this, uh, uh, we uh, analyzed uh, uh, a lot of experience from different cities, and then uh, we uh, decided to develop our uh, uh, method for the um, prognosis of uh, 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 diagnosis of the city where it stands at the moment. And uh, then we developed a methodology of how to achieve and uh, how to evaluate what achievement was, was done for the smart uh, city um, system implementation. Uh, the uh, diagnosis matrix uh, exists, uh, uh, consists of uh, five steps. Mm, then uh, uh, we analyze uh, what is uh, uh, what is uh, 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 best practice across uh, the globe. Then uh, we created a matrix uh, of uh, uh, levels and uh, uh, criteria. Then we made uh, detailed descriptions of uh, uh, proficiency criteria. Uh, then uh, 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 Using this, uh, uh, what uh, descriptions we uh, we are proposing to use an analysis of the current situation, and uh, then uh, to develop the prior priorities and the plans uh, for the next steps. Uh, uh, that that uh, 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 detailed criteria uh, they uh, look uh, like in the slide. It is for smart economies from uh, smart society, smart environment, smart government, smart mobility, and uh, smart life and services. And all these uh, detailed uh, criteria, every has uh, uh, five levels uh, uh, with uh, the descriptions uh, uh, at, uh, to evaluate at uh, what situation the city is at the moment. For example, uh, for level one, uh, it is individual systems designed to perform a particular particular function or function implemented without an information system at all. Level two is a dialogue between different services providers on the exchange of data and the establishment of links between systems. Level three, the city has a strategic approach and a technological and investment basis. Level four is analysis forecast and response to real-time data in the city. And level five is the city has an open inclusive system that is constantly evolving and uh, the city is innovative and uh, uh, competitive. Uh, for some of uh, these uh, detailed uh, criteria, these dimensions is not uh, analyzed, but then mm, it is checked uh, by this red uh, X. Uh, uh, when uh, we speak about uh, the uh, smart city diagnostic level, uh, first level is separate system. It means that uh, the system, uh, city focuses on developing digital and data-driven services. Level two, cooperation between systems. A city has uh, this holistic system, uh, systematic thinking and goals. Then level three is integrated systems, a uh, city with a strategic approach and technological and investment based as level uh, uh, four, it's managed uh, systems, it's real time data analytics, forecasting and the responsive city. Uh, level five is system of the systems, uh, an open, inclusive, constantly changing, innovative and competitive uh, city. 
then uh, uh, we developed the matrices, uh, uh, which looks uh, like this uh, for the evaluating the existing situation. And uh, then uh, we need to collect uh, the information about the city in uh, different uh, uh, spheres or these uh, criteria for the smart economy, from the smart society, smart environment, smart government, smart mobility, and uh, smart uh, life services. For example, if we talk about the smart mobility, then we can divide it uh, in a lot of different topics. For example, e-ticket, uh, weather forecasting, traffic safety, uh, management of the traffic lights and the tessera. And for every of this, uh, we can evaluate at what level the system is at the moment. Uh, when we, uh, for the, the, uh, doing this analysis, uh, very hard work is needed because uh, you, uh, first of all, it is needed to, to divide to these topics. Then uh, it is needed to collect a lot of information, to do a lot of interviews, uh, to, to, to check a lot of documents or a lot of databases what uh, the cities um, have at the moment. And uh, uh, when it is done, then uh, uh, it is proposed to have a decision with the society and the politics and decide uh, uh, what level, in what uh, criteria the city wants to achieve. And that means that uh, 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 for the concept, you need to, to, to write the plan and actions and uh, budget, what uh, 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 solutions should be implemented or what uh, should be changed to achieve uh, these levels. Actually, uh, for the very similar uh, uh, methodology for evaluating and uh, achieving, European Reconstruction Bank is uh, doing uh, six uh, methodologies for uh, water uh, management, water systems management, waste uh, management, uh, urban management, and transport management. And uh, a very similar methodology will be approved and the cities before approaching for to get a loan or funding will be needed to first of all to evaluate using the methodology what uh, and where they stand and then uh, to show what they want to achieve and then they will get uh, the funding for these achievements to 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 to, to get and uh, yes i am happy that i i am managing now this uh, project and we are uh, working directly with the uh, London office and uh, this methodology, I think that it will be very similar to what I am presenting now, will be uh, transferred uh, to uh, uh, a lot of countries uh, where European Reconstruction Bank acts. Yes, it is uh, uh, well, different uh, systems of uh, uh, the city uh, and uh, how the systems uh, should work. And one of the main criteria is to join a lot of different systems to one system or one database to, to, to start to manage all the systems. Yes, uh, then uh, this methodology and what I uh, was presenting before, we uh, analyzed and uh, uh, piloted on the real city. Uh, the city is in Lithuania. It is the fourth biggest city in Lithuania, Shaulei, and uh, Shaulei has uh, 100,000 uh, inhabitants. And here you can see uh, pictures uh, how the city uh, look like. Uh, uh, I, I need to say that I was born in this city for that reason. It was very important to have this uh, first uh, real smart city concept somewhere where I know the situation uh, very well. And uh, I'm happy that that was uh, uh, Shaulei. And Shaulei said that uh, for this uh, smart city uh, concept implementation, uh, what was what will be done, uh, all the solutions, they will allocate uh, uh, only for this concept implementation 10 million euros. And later on, I will show what solutions or what steps they are already implementing and what uh, uh, is already working in this city. 
actually this uh, uh, smart city concept was approved in 2020 and uh, uh, from this time they are moving with uh, uh, converting the city to the smart city uh, one of uh, the very important uh, things is uh, that uh, to decide uh, when city has a concept of the smart city where this concept stands it is uh, in higher position in legislation for the strategic plan of the city or it is in lower level now for that reason uh, we analyzed a lot of uh, the documents uh, plans and uh, uh, legal act of the city to understand what and uh, what the power is of the smart city does a smart city concept or strategy eliminates uh, uh, another strategies for example strategy for education strategy for mobility um, strategic plan of the city or etc and we found that uh, this uh, uh, smart city concept and uh, actually it was approved by the uh, administration of the city that it must cover in very different documents, different topics, and they can show the different ways how the uh, uh, different uh, uh, strategic documents should be implemented. And uh, they approved this uh, strategic smart city concept, uh, very similar to the main strategic city plan, and uh, they um, tried to call, uh, join both of these documents, not to work in uh, all type way, and then implement the smart solutions. For example, if uh, they were in uh, plan to, to reconstruct junctions, then they said that we will use, uh, okay, we will leave in the strategic plan that we need to reconstruct junctions of the streets, but uh, uh, detailed how it should be, uh, it will be, uh, linked to the smart city concept and there will be uh, already detailed written what uh, and uh, this junction should be what devices or, or sensor should be implemented and in that uh, way uh, the uh, document as the legal act was implemented in the city legislation uh, system uh, then uh, uh, yes uh, we uh, we need to uh, understand that uh, uh, the smart uh, city concept is not uh, only what uh, only city politicians or the professionals uh, should do, but uh, this uh, smart city um, solutions and uh, uh, achievements must be oriented only for the citizens, for the better quality of life, like I showed. For that reason, involvement of the society and the citizens is very important. Uh, for that reason, uh, the very deep survey, focus groups, and interviews, uh, and uh, um, workshops uh, uh, was done. And uh, for example, when we speak about the smart society, uh, we analyzed a lot of uh, uh, different topics, education, communality, technological literacy, and the Tessera uh, topics. And uh, then we ask people to select uh, what is more, most important for them, what they want to achieve and where their fun, funds uh, must be invested to achieve something. And for example, for the smart uh, society, uh, the education was selected as uh, the uh, main imp important uh, topic. And uh, for this, uh, they uh, said that uh, electronic enrollment of the students in the school should be implemented a database of uh, pedagogical specialists of Shuli must be developed and STEM center information systems for the publishing non-formal education should be developed. When we asked about the smart governments, uh, uh, they, uh, the, the people from the city said that uh, they, most of uh, all, they want to have internet-based uh, services then uh, they want to have open municipality and involving uh, the society in management and uh, inclusive, uh, for example, inclusive uh, budget of the city was as one of the solutions of uh, the smart city. Uh, yes, uh, uh, when we asked about the smart mobility, 
uh, the traffic safety was uh, one of the most important uh, things and uh, they asked uh, uh, the society to, to, to focus on the smart traffic uh, lights and management and automatic uh, penalties uh, system in, in introducing in the city. For the smart life uh, topic, uh, society said that culture and well-being is most important. And uh, they said that uh, they want to have a city level, unified city events calendar and uh, unified system of the sports basis. It means that, that every citizen can go to the website of the city and check where is the free place, for example, for playing basketball or doing another sport activities. For the smart environment, uh, uh, people said that uh, they want to uh, improvement in the infrastructure and uh, 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 citywide wireless internet smart utility sensors, uh, uh, which collects uh, different uh, the different uh, data and that helps to have better planning uh, is very important for them. For the smart uh, economy, uh, local and international relations uh, uh, was uh, selected as the most important and they said that, uh, uh, okay, we would like to see the Shulia as very innovative city and uh, uh, we would like to have Urban Living Lab uh, Shule, and we want to invite international companies to come to the Shule to test uh, uh, warrior solutions and uh, that uh, will grow as an ec economy. Uh, then uh, uh, after the collecting the, all the information, opinions, and after all discussions, we found that uh, the city level of smartness now is uh, for uh, most of the criteria is the level one and only for the smart government uh, they are entering to the uh, level two. Uh, then uh, uh, the main slogan of the smart uh, city Shule was uh, selected that uh, the smart city of Shule combines advanced technologies, population uh, involvement and education and modern management principles. So this integration enables uh, us to create an ever involving data driven urban system for the well being of the uh, community. Uh, then uh, was a developed matrix of uh, what uh, the city wants uh, to achieve and in what areas, uh, what level uh, should be uh, uh, achieved. Here is a, a lot of text. Uh, I think that uh, I can share the slides uh, later on if you would be interested to read it. And uh, 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 it was uh, approved by the uh, city uh, government. And they said that uh, the most important focus will be put on the smart mobility and the smart environment. But uh, 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 they will work even in smart society and will implement the solutions, uh, smart economy, smart governments, and smart life. Later on, a very detailed plan uh, was, uh, was done with uh, budgeting and uh, uh, technical specification, uh, what uh, should be done uh, to achieve the smart level uh, tools, smart level, uh, smart city level three and smart city level uh, four. For example, for the uh, smart uh, transportation, uh, for the achieving uh, the smart level, uh, smart city level two, uh, city must implement uh, parking sensors, traffic light sensors, speed and traffic uh, cameras, weather and pavement sensors, uh, route information, uh, uh, platform uh, which includes urban uh, public transport, suburban and uh, interurban public transport management uh, and joining uh, together with uh, car sharing and taxi services and that will let uh, to move uh, lit on later on stages to the uh, public transport on demand. Uh, then promoting uh, uh, transport uh, sharing services and uh, that uh, uh, should be managed by city coordination center. And actually, a uh, year ago, they developed the real 
uh, city coordination center and started to join all these uh, uh, systems and solutions to, to one concentrated uh, uh, city coordination center. Uh, for the smart uh, city level two, uh, the upgrade for the city coordination center, real-time response interface to property management information system um, was decided uh, to select. And uh, uh, from they said that from 2026, they would like to achieve the uh, fourth level of the smart uh, city and uh, they, they said that uh, then we will start to implement centers for autonomic, autonomous vehicle control, route information, mobility as a service concept, and a tesser. For uh, uh, another uh, uh, criteria, I think that it, it will not be enough time to go through all of this, but uh, uh, for example, uh, the solutions as a city 3D model, which they started uh, to do remote uh, resources sensors uh, should be implemented for the smart society. Like I said before, the Shuli STEM center was approved and uh, uh, I think last year it was already opened. Uh, this education plans uh, is already started to develop uh, for the smart uh, economy they opened uh, promoting innovative business and startups uh, hub and uh, uh, for the next few years uh, they are planning to use uh, urban living lab of Shule, integrated tourist information center and a lot of other things for the smart uh, governments uh, they made the, the real actions i will show uh, in next slides uh, what uh, they achieve, started to achieve but they started to automize and digitize all the public services. They started an inclusive budget and started to use Shule platform, which includes a resident card, with, which is cloud-based with several features, for, for example, public transport ticket, loyalty programs, payments, and uh, a lot of uh, features which works uh, for the city level. Yes, uh, uh, to implement uh, all these uh, systems, uh, we draw, uh, draw the uh, uh, concept scheme of uh, different systems, what uh, uh, city at the moment has and uh, how the systems uh, should be uh, joined. The main and very important system is asset management system. And if we, we talk about the smart city, first of all, we need to have a very good data and uh, the data must be uh, settled in asset man management systems. Then uh, uh, asset management system will uh, co uh, communicate with traffic management system, security monitoring system, uh, very uh, specialized uh, systems. And that will lead to the real smart city system. Then, uh, like I said before, uh, they developed coordination center with uh, very different uh, features and responsibilities in all the smart city topics. And uh, this uh, center uh, started to implement uh, these uh, projects already in the city. Uh, the next stage, uh, what uh, uh, it done, uh, it was uh, that uh, they started to do automatic uh, uh, digitized uh, public services and join uh, the uh, uh, city systems with national uh, systems, uh, with uh, uh, health, uh, with uh, social insurance and et cetera, just to let uh, for the people, for example, if you want to get a permission for the building, you need to wait uh, 20 working days. This system, uh, what uh, they already for the several services implemented, let, uh, let's uh, uh, to do in uh, one or two minutes, uh, the online payments uh, were integrated and that uh, increased uh, the um, happiness of the citizens. Uh, very big uh, uh, job was done. Uh, when uh, implementing this uh, 
uh, project uh, and later on uh, drawing the new scheme. And you, you can see in my screen, there is a scheme of all IT uh, systems in very different organizations in the city, what they have and how they must be joined to exchange the data and have uh, the really integrated and joint smart city uh, uh, system working because you don't need to, uh, to allocate everything in one place. But if uh, there is a different responsibility, responsible organization, they can exchange uh, the data, but uh, somebody needs to have a vision and uh, how to do that. And yes, it is uh, my last uh, slide. Uh, first of all, if uh, the smart city concept uh, is prepared and uh, it is uh, wanted to be implemented, first of all, the very good quality data must be selected from, from and stored in uh, effective systems uh, for possibility to exchange. If there will be data in papers, in uh, shelves, or et cetera, the smart city concept will not uh, work. Uh, then uh, mm, this data must be digitalized. And uh, uh, another one uh, very important thing, uh, what I found, uh, implementing different projects and this that uh, you know this uh, shining eyes of the heads of the city of the specialists uh, who works uh, that uh, they want to move to the smart city and uh, very important is uh, to increase the uh, qualification and experience of the uh, specialist who works because all the solutions, all the decisions, all the sensors, everything is, in, uh, is improved, not only, not of, already in the months, but in the hours. And uh, if you want to be on top notch, if you want to invest in the most modern solutions, you need to improve your uh, qualification. And that is very important for, 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 for implementation of the smart uh, city uh, concept. That was uh, my last slide. I want to say thank you, and maybe there will be uh, questions. Oh, thank you very much, Agidius. So uh, does anyone have any questions from the uh, audience? Well, don't be shy. That was a really impressive presentation showing the insights of the smart city. How does that really work with all the um, data and connectivity to the different sensors and implementation to uh, the, the management and administrative system? Okay, I'll crack the eyes. <laughs> so if hypothetically, um, all the cities become smart, implementing all these tools and then you know, there's no more levels where to go ahead. So what's beyond the smart city? What What is the next level when everyone becomes smart? I think that uh, it will be, I forgot the word, but it is already, uh, uh, some cities is already thinking about uh, uh, even next step of the smart city. It is, uh, I forgot how it is named. And I think for next 10 years, we will implement all these smart city uh, approaches. But after the smart city, we will have uh, smarter smart cities uh, approaches and the new technologies and new uh, um, solutions will, will come. Is that going to be something like... Not, Sorry. Yes, so the life is not standing in the place and uh, we are all the time improving uh, what we have at the moment. But uh, the difference what we had before and what we can uh, have with the smart city is very big difference. And I think that uh, the cities uh, implementing the smart city concept for the same budget, because you know, when we talk about the, about the cities, we always need to think about the politicals, about the budgeting, about the quality of life. And that is very correlating uh, between. It means that this smart city concept sometimes let's to, to have the same quality of life with less budget and the saved budget can be used for different uh, you know purposes uh, yeah. purposes yes okay so is that the smarter or like super cities <laughs> that will be developing later 
Okay, thank you. Any questions? Looks like everyone is heading for the lunch. <laughs> so, oh, Christopher, go ahead. Christopher, we can't hear you. I think it's the same problem. Christopher um, had the problems with connecting his audio to, to, to the computer. Christopher, what about uh, texting in the chat your question so Igidius can read and answer? Yeah, hello. Oh, hi. Uh, hi. Sorry. So I, I had to connect with like a different phone. So my question is, do you think the more smart the city gets, it becomes resilient to like problems? Uh, you, you know, uh, to, uh, what I could say that uh, every, uh, we don't need to, to convert the city to the smart city if uh, it uh, brings uh, worse uh, conditions for the living in the city. And uh, I think that uh, these uh, smart uh, uh, solutions and that smart approach can and must improve uh, the quality and the, uh, for the people living in the cities. I think that you cannot, uh, mm, what is very important when uh, all the decisions, all the uh, solutions, all the devices, everything what is installed, planned and done must be oriented to the better quality of life. If uh, it will not bring it is not needed to just uh, implement something because of the neighbor city has. And that uh, what I saw during my career, that a lot of cities, uh, uh, they say that they want to be a smart city or sometimes uh, they want to invest in this and then they buy something what is not needed for them, what is not to join. For example, in Lithuania, we had uh, this, this uh, um, approach that they said that, oh, okay, we will be smart city and we will have a smart lightning. And they bought uh, the LED lamps uh, with a lot of features and not joined to any other um, systems. And why to do that? Nobody knows. Or sometimes uh, uh, when we talk about uh, traffic lightning uh, lights uh, in the streets, Part of them are very modern and smart, but they are not joined to the system. Why to waste the money if it will not bring anything for the society? Every decision uh, and every uh, and uh, every implemented project must be, you know, uh, discussed and uh, the real this business case or quality improvement case must be done before implementation and then a uh, uh, smart city can do the more resilient city. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, any other questions? Okay, maybe Agidius, if you could pass uh, to me the slides so I can share them with the students. And if someone will have questions, I saw that there's your email. So probably they will email you individually what specifically is important for them because not all of the students are present today and they will listen to the recording as well. So probably they will have quite a lot of questions on the 28th week when you also will be present with us there. Okay, thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, bye. Uh, have a good day. Okay, thank you for uh, your attendance in this um, really intensive third day. We have two more days to go. I hope you're not getting too tired. So let's have a lunch break and let's meet at half past two in Central European time. Okay, have a good lunch break. <laughs>